Phantom of the Paradise by Barney Rostowing. Based on the original screenplay by Brian De Palma. Carmine Abarno was a mafia lounge piano player who had left Teaneck, New Jersey, because the sound of traffic gave him headaches. The height of his 46-year-old ambitions had been to be a classy bebop player in the style of Oscar Peterson, but in Dunphy, Maine, his life changed radically. He drank more, and being able to sleep made him very fat, he stayed in his room a lot, teaching music to the area youth. A year before being decapitated during a nap on the railroad tracks, he acquired a very good student from the regional high school who learned how to play like Oscar Peterson in six weeks, and who was engaged in writing a four-hour opera making use of literally everything he knew about music and life. This Winslow Leach was everyone's plague in Dunphy, he did not fit well, his mother wanted him to take a part-time job, the teachers wanted him to learn history, English, and mathematics, and his father wanted him to chase women. At 18 Winslow continued growing, tall and weedy, living on carbohydrates, his skin blotchy and his music continuous. After Carmine's death Winslow took a day off from his electric piano for a walk in the tall pines outside town where he mulled over the problems raised by Carmine's death. He did not know whom to ask for his copy of the Slonimsky scale thesaurus, which he had loaned Carmine. He had never actually written down the names of people in New York who could help him. Most of all, he had no place to go. Carmine used to welcome him at all hours out of a sad fascination with his, Winslow's, perfect musical mind. Carmine would pose a problem and Winslow would solve it. Carmine would teach him something and Winslow would learn it as fast as conveyed, never to forget it. And Winslow's total Yankee refusal to understand Carmine as a person, added to his utter inability to find anything remarkable about bebop music, had in some sense placed Carmine drunk across the railroad tracks on the full moon night of January 12th. It was cold in the woods, too cold for Winslow's hands, which he thought about constantly, like a runner obsessed with his legs. He had a vaguely allergic reaction to nature, an ectomorphic, clumsy, slow-blooded response to things not of the mind. Walking through the woods seemed sillier and sillier, and he was oblivious to the snow-sheeted hills, blue sky and other northern beauties. He had wanted to get away from people saying he must feel terrible to lose such a good friend and teacher. What was terrible to Winslow was not being able to work, the senseless confusion, his fingers losing coordination and muscle tone. But the cold air in his sinuses seemed to clarify some things. He would have to be leaving after graduation, he had developed a need for adult musical company. He needed success, because success would mean long hours alone in a warm place with multi-channel tape machines, and people who could do his music the way it had to be done. Had to be done. That was the point, sex, friendship, love, belongings. Art with a capital A, God and other diversions were not the point. The point was, if he stopped doing what he had to do, he would go bananas, which was what friends and relatives thought he was already. Because they had nothing better to do with their time than stare at people. He needed to go to New York City, closer than Los Angeles, which would be just as good, and locate Alan D. Swan, because this Mr. Swan had the resources to do anything that could be done in the music business. That was clear from what he produced, some of which Winslow almost liked. After a point, about two in this Sunday afternoon, Winslow began to enjoy being numb, because he was finding it easier to think clearly. The sun was getting through the gray sky, and the damp was lifting. It didn't occur to him that he was experiencing something Carmine had tried to explain to him several times. He was filled instead with the importance of the experience, the usefulness of it. Winslow felt keen and realistic, being a practical Yankee tradesman by upbringing, rather than an Italian piano player from New York. He passed through the numb zone and had a sudden decision. He decided for music, and doing so he felt a solid glowing warmth beaming up through his body. He decided that since he couldn't do anything else, understand the importance of anything else, he might as well go the whole hog. He used the expression whole hog while talking to himself, which he did from time to time during his 14-minute moment of decision. He decided to leave Dunphy immediately, within days or weeks, the best way he could, and with some money, because Carmine had stressed that you need some money when you get to the Apple. He decided to secretly sell what he owned, except for the electric piano. He would travel with the piano, 70 pounds of it, on one arm, and his bag on the other. 
He saw a helpful black man with a red hat helping him off the train at Grand Central, telling him a good place to stay and putting him in a cab. He had never seen Grand Central, and not many black men in his life. Or cabs either. He also decided it would be necessary to take the car Saturday night when everyone went to the movies. Drive all night and abandon it in Brattleboro, where he could get a train to New York. He decided to make lists of everything he needed to do, as far into the future as he could imagine, so that he wouldn't be forgetting things and making the mistakes his mother liked to talk about. If you had to act smart to get your music out there, he would be smart. Why not? And suddenly, weirdly, he thought of Carmine for the first time. Carmine saying, you're a smart kid, Winnie, but you better start using it if you want to get out there with the guys who can play. It was the end of his decision moment, and he came out the other end moving faster than he ever had before in his teenage life. He felt he had traveled a time warp which put him permanently ahead of the people he knew, like his parents, the guys at school, friends, everyone. Except Carmine. So he was in a place between Dunphy and the world beyond death, where a great deal more was known. He was unsentimental about the whole thing, now that his head was clear. There was just one little illumination before he again saw the outside world, which was quite deep into Skilton's meadows at the moment, he saw that Carmine had made one mistake, he had forgotten to keep music the most important thing. Carmine had got mixed up with people. Wives, friends, kids, relatives. Winslow sensed that clearly, it needed no proof. That had been Carmine's problem. Next he sensed the time, three o'clock, with a dying winter sun over a blue-gray sheet of weathered snow. The cold hovering. A faint dry stiffness to the air, and his blood pumping strongly from the center of his body. He walked an arc that continued the curves of his tracks up into the meadow and circled around toward home, which was several miles back. When he got to the old logging road he ran his slow lanky run for a while, letting the marvelous new energy out, not exactly happy, but not confused or anxious. Arriving home in the snowy dark he saw his father's eyes first. The father was tall like Winslow, but solid. A modest intelligent middle-class man who owned the best garage in the area, and who had attended the Okinawa landing in World War II without cracking. His father noticed the change in his son's expression and was more pleased than not, though he didn't understand what it was about. Winslow looked at his father and saw what he usually saw, a large difficult power to be dealt with. But there was a short moment of understanding that he didn't mind. It meant peace. His father was stepping into the kitchen from the parlor when this happened, and Winslow was entering from the back porch. Following his father came his sister, and then from the pantry came his mother with a large steaming bowl of soup, concentrating her attentions on her son. Mr. Leach got the ritual respect, and Mrs. Leach knew her daughter would get on nicely with no help, but Joan Leach was afraid her Gunnybird son would have some kind of relapse into depression because of Mr. Abamo's death. He felt her eyes on him like shapeless weight. He wondered if his father would remark again that it was time for John Lennon to be out of the country, but Mr. Leach was withdrawn. It was a quiet meal, the kind Winslow liked. Following the chops his father bitched about the oil filter people and his mother commiserated, but his young sister said nothing at all. After dinner Winslow went to his room, plugged his headphones into the electric piano and worked on a grand theme to appear at the end of his opera. No one interfered. Winslow, his piano, his suitcase and his $428 arrived in New York via Port Authority bus terminal rather than Grand Central, and he was somewhat shocked upon debarking into the mad welter of hustlers, hookers, desperados and lower middle Americans gathered densely there in confused misery. He had never seen anything like it, and his foot was asleep. His heavy country clothes made him sweat. The sweat made him dizzy, and he felt his calm musical decisiveness melting in this lake of ordinary people. They were the kind of people his parents wouldn't like, and he didn't either. He had never seen so many people in such a small space, nor had he ever seen such an incrustation of grime and filth. Nor was there anyone to help him with his hundred pounds of luggage, which he parked carefully against a wall while trying to think. He needed to rest, though he had been dozing off and on for hours. Act 3 of his opera, which had been building in his head for days, was in danger of being forgotten, of dying inside him like Carmine's dreams. A black man did come up and offer to help, but Winslow saw he was not in uniform and stiffly said, you could help me by telling me where to get a taxi. 
Hey, fuck you cracker, trying to be regular. Stick that piano up your ass man, I hope somebody take it away. With this he walked off, unafraid of the big Yankee boy's response. Sweat gathered thicker on Winslow's brow, and under his arms, where it trickled down to his torso, and on the legs, and he felt sticky and unclean. He blindly hoisted his load and got through the congested uncaring room to a door, where he saw a New York street for the first time, and an endless pack of yellow cabs jamming the street illegally. Pardon me, is there a line for the taxis, he asked a little grey-haired woman. She looked at him briefly. If there is, you come after me, kid. He blundered around and people seized cabs within his clumsy grasp, but after a while he found one which would accept the piano if he didn't insist on putting it in the trunk, which was jammed. But he would pay for the trunk, the cabbie explained, that was an ironclad rule. I need to find a good inexpensive hotel, explained Winslow. You need someone to keep an eye on you in this city, kid, said the cabbie. You a musician? Yes, I am. Well, try the Allen, you'll find a lot like yourself there. Thank you, said Winslow. How far is that, I mean, how much will it cost to get there? About two fifty, said the cabbie, who realized there was no possibility of a tip, but was still interested in his passenger. Winslow sat pinned down by the electric piano but hardly noticing it as he took in the rush hour faces. They looked pretty ordinary to him, pretty much caught up in things the way he didn't want to be. Beyond that he had no reaction except to marvel at how many of these faces there were. Quickly they were transformed into material for Act 3, in which Foster, Winslow's Yankee Faust, is pursued by a mob. The only mobs Winslow had ever seen had been in movies, and the angry passivity of these new faces was quite different. He heard them grunting in his opera, a huge chorus like tortured apes. Simple figures in some primitive scale, something like Orf, but only in passing, until Foster broke free on a bridge. Or something. The chant was clear, and he had filed it for reference before they stopped in front of the Allen. Give Emma a week up front, said the cabbie. Then pay a few weeks on time, and they'll come through when you need some credit. Oh, said Winslow, not bothering to understand any of this. Then he paid the 240 on the meter plus 50 cents for the unused trunk, and wrestled his gear out. Inside the lobby a very old man, a welfare case, watched dimly. Behind the desk a thirty-ish woman who had seen many good, bad, and indifferent musicians looked him over briefly for hayseeds. I would like an inexpensive room for the next two weeks, said Winslow as he had been trained to do. Forty-five, fifty-five or sixty, asked the woman. That's the weekly rate, asked Winslow slowly. That's what it is, dear, she said, looking without much interest into the bright blue eyes. She didn't see much behind them except ego, which was very common at the Allen, more so than money. What's the difference? Forty-five is no view and an outside bath. Fifty-five is your own bath, and sixty is your own bath with a view. Winslow was no connoisseur of bathrooms, but he did stop to think for just a moment about it before handing her the ninety dollars she had known he would give her. She had even known it would come clumsily off a wad that came out of a side pants pocket. To your right and up the stairs. They're working on the elevator, she said, passing him a key with a large Allen printed on a plastic tag attached to it. Thank you. I wonder if you know where I could find an inexpensive radio in the neighborhood? She laughed a thirty-ish good-humored New York laugh. Right in that room, she said, pointing to her right. That's where Mr. Sherman is, he owns the hotel. In that room, a dull room whose face had not been lifted when the lobby got its treatment, sat the corpulent Mr. Sherman, and behind him were stacked many radios, stereos, amplifiers and musical instruments, mostly guitars. Winslow grasped that these items had been seized for non-payment of rent, and wondered why second-rate musicians were always getting in over their heads. It was just like Dunphy. When Mr. Sherman's silence failed to intimidate the new boy, he said briefly, I'm Sherman, can I do something for you? I need a small radio. The lady at the desk thought you could get one for me. Look, M over, kid. Winslow did, and came up with a combination radio, tape and record player. How much is this? That's a good one, you know. Belonged to a very well-known singer used to be here. Just got his record out. That's worth at least $85. Too much for me, said Winslow briefly, and settled for a $20 one, 
which he slung over his shoulder. Then he went back out to the lobby, where still no bellboy had appeared, and carried his worldly belongings around the comer toward the stairs. Around this corner the building matched the dull interior of Mr. Sherman's office, and so did room 206. The only surprise in room 206 was someone in the bed, which angered Winslow. He felt very intruded upon and not afraid at all. I'd like to know what you're doing here, whoever you are, he said in a clanking righteous main voice. A very small low voice greeted him, a vague foggy, huh? I said this is my room and you don't belong here. This is illegal. Oh Jesus, please don't say anything, said the voice, which he now realized was female. A very thin face with wild frizzy hair peeped out into the umber gray of the room. Just let me get myself together and I'll be gone, said the voice. I've got problems, believe me. Winslow felt he knew something about women because they had generally helped him, but this voice was different. It had a fleeting lightness about it foreign to his world. I'm sorry, he said ponderously. I was just surprised. So was I, said the little voice of the little face. Winslow now saw she was very pretty. His eyes and reactions adjusted to the dark room and he was actually rather happy to be in contact with someone who gave him some respect. He pictured her as someone Foster would need to meet on his journey to final knowledge, and she saw him as a potentially cooperative well-behaved young dude who was square enough to keep himself together, a rarity at the Allen. She smiled a smile that wasn't actually practiced, but very precise. It's funny meeting someone like this. I feel so embarrassed. Do you want to put your clothes on? I'm almost afraid to. I've been sick. I had to give up my room, and the person who had this room gave me an extra key. He saw she had no place to go, but more than that he heard a lilt in her voice that fascinated him. It was an elusive, very musical sound, very flexible. She would sing a long sad song. A simple song that didn't go anywhere, smooth and endless. Well, I have things to do, but go on sleeping. After I get set up I'll be quiet. Thanks, she said. You sure are being nice about this. He was glad to have found her there, it had restored his sense of importance and power, as if she were standing in for his sister and mother without the disadvantages of either, but he wondered about the way she said sure instead of surely. Yet it sounded right. As he took off his mackinaw and sweater she watched to see what would come next. The piano came next, patched into his headset and a cassette, into which he played the street chorus music inspired by the taxi ride and the crowds, and then the little girl's theme as he called the melody this lady had inspired. It all took only 10 or 12 minutes, and when he had coded it, which he did with some beeps of the C-sharp key, he noticed the smell from his heavy woolen socks, and the sensation of general perspiration. The room was very warm. Time for a bath. In another room in a better part of town, in a room twelve times as large as Winslow's, and overlooking the Jersey Palisades, Swan emerged from his sauna. The room was stark white, adorned in Spartan fashion with a white horseshoe-shaped desk and an off-white polar bear rug. Swan's robe presented him as a small cool potentate of discriminating tastes. It matched his light brown eyes, even to having yellow flecks and an uneven texture. The effect was designed to softly contrast with the dreyeresque quality of the surroundings. Smooth yellow hair crowned Swan's head, and photogray lenses mounted in delicate handmade frames completed the picture. He was barefoot, as was everyone who gained entrance into the chamber. In a corner of the room sat Arnold Philbin, a large round crude man who had found a calling in his service to Swan. Philbin watched as Swan pulled a large file card from the pocket of his robe. The last week in Los Angeles had wasted Philbin, left him depressed. But Swan still moved with the grace and ease of a man born to rule, fueled on greed and adrenaline. Swan spoke in a light baritone, a voice that seemed disconnected from his fair young face. Once, slowly, he said. Joyce Kramer. Cancel. What do I tell her? You don't. The girl answering line 4 simply says we're both out and can't be reached, and the project is cancelled. When it isn't cancelled, she'll hate the girl, not us. Okay. The Juicy Fruit Singles. Hold off. I don't like anything we have for them. Frigis is gonna freak out of his mind. That's a hard contract. I'll talk to Frigis. 
We've got one in the can from the last session that sounds enough like the others to keep them happy. Yeah, but the mix was screwed up, remember? Besides, it's only one tune and the B-side is terrible. Right. That's what I said, isn't it? Say, is the girl still asleep in the other room? Philbin went to the closed-circuit television console mounted behind the desk. He pressed a button to reveal a long-legged black girl lolling on a waterbed in Swan's bedroom suite. She was scratching her afro boredly. No, she's wide awake, spoke Philbin. Well, get her out. I like to be able to walk around my own house when I'm thinking. What else do you have? Steve Warner, said Philbin, flicking off the monitor. Swan laughed softly. That's a long-term problem. What to do with the money? Carry him forward. The real problem is what the hell to do with those Jersey punks now that we've hoisted them up to the point where their assholes are showing. Why did it have to be them, Arnold? You're responsible for that. Do you know that not a single one of them has come up with anything yet? All they do is wiggle their bellies and pant. It costs a fortune getting them on tape. 200,000 for an LP. Ridiculous. Not a writer in the bunch. It was Angelo. Not me. He got them. Your friend Angelo. Well, they're good on a tour, they're tough. Look what happened to Annette. It's the same thing. Digging up material and hiring studio men. What I wouldn't give for a real talent. Anyway, let the girl stay. She gives incredible massages. Anything else? Annette. Let's see what she does. Anything else? Nothing I can't handle. Well, go get a massage then. In fact, get some acupuncture. It could be a song, you know, Italian punk meets nice Chinese girl with needle on Lower Mott Street. Or the other way around, eh? I guess you want to go ahead with the auditions? I don't want to, Arnold, I've got to because the fruits are musical illiterates. When are they? Where are they? Condor, tomorrow, at noon. All right. Have someone be there to line them up and we'll get there around too. Open end, I'm afraid. By the way, you need some new clothes. Old clothes, I mean. You look like 1961 with those things you're wearing. Go downtown to an Army-Navy store. Look at the pictures in Rolling Stone, Arnold. Time passes. And at the Allen the girl with the pretty hair had gone back to sleep while the new talent stood under a trickle of lukewarm water in the hall bath. Having got his latest ideas into the cassette he had begun to think about what to do with himself and his music in New York. His deep blue eyes had the glow of happy energy overcoming fatigue. The water suddenly became a deluge, allowing him to rinse off the soap, and he went back to the room in fresh new dungarees feeling very well. The girl slept on. Having nothing better to do, he disconnected the earphones and turned on the amplifier in the piano very softly, running scales up and down, all kinds of scales in all kinds of variations. They burst out of his happy hands with the strength of his gaunt farmer forebears, and with a quick lightness that Carmine Abamo had taught him. When he reached the top of the keyboard he played a chromatic flurry and did more of the same, coming back down with a demonic power that showed in the proud glitter of his eyes, feeling sure as he did that very few people could do what he was doing, and most of them had taken half a lifetime to do it. And none of them were into rock opera. He stomped a chord on the end of this, and in the pause the girl spoke. Boy, you sure got something going on with that piano, Mr. Leach. Her voice had a delightful fuzziness never heard in the state of Maine. Winslow smiled a horsey smile. I try, he said. You got things of your own? He gestured to the pile of music which had been established neatly in the corner by the window. Piles of it. I have to meet people now. I don't know a damn person in this city but you, and I don't even know your name. Phoenix. That's my stage name. I used to be Ellen Rado. Say, play me some more, I really like music. That's how come I got hung up in this place. It's full of musicians. Play me some songs. He started with, Foster's Lament. As he was calling it at that point, I was not myself last night, couldn't set things right with apologies or flowers. Out of place as a crying clown who can only frown and the play went on for hours. 
And then as I lost control I swore I'd sell my soul for one love, who would sing my songs. Then he stomped. Roll on thunder, shine on lightning, days are long and the nights are frightening, nothing matters anyhow, and that's the hell of it. Winter comes and winds blow colder, some grew wiser, you just grew older, and you never listened anyway, and that's the hell of it. When he had finished she let a few seconds go by. Your voice is kind of thin in the high parts, but you sure have got a lot of class, Winslow. How old are you? Twenty. The lie felt good. Everything felt good. The girl in the bed smiled. Well, before this town gets to you, you gotta go to the additions. There's a voice and some magazines on that table. I can show you where to go. I'll play you some more songs while you do it. And he played several more songs from the opera, a fast one, a funny one and a wildly dissonant one. He went on for 25 or 30 minutes, improvising little segues between the songs, and was suddenly tired. I just don't believe you're not a star yet, said Phoenix. There's no one in this place that's close to you, just as a writer, and you're a motherfucker player too. You're scary. The word motherfucker shocked him profoundly, even made him a little dizzy, although his opera had incest, along with rape, madness and other intense human behavior. I circled the ones that are still happening, she said, gesturing to the papers and magazines. The ones with checks are for real, you ought to hit those first. There was something about her down-to-earth attitude that created a certain respect in Winslow, he realized she was not like the girls at home, and he wanted her to see he realized it, so he looked at her across the narrow space between piano and bed. She smiled, and his body answered. While young and awkward, Winslow was not stupid. The next thing he noticed, which made him a believer from the top, was her rhythmic sense of the situation. She actually knew what it was about, and he respected that. Girls up in Dunphy fucked, but they didn't ball. It was a new concept to him. Her smile was in sync with the subtle rhythm of her bodily movements, which hovered on the borderline of directness without leaving real doubt. Her eyes, open rather than squinched with guilt to come, rested on his without embarrassment. He was being appreciated for his very own self as he saw himself, not as some weirdly entrancing thing. Winslow was not a smiler, but he smiled. She saw the smile and found it crude but not unpleasant. There was something behind it, she decided, a stone bitch musician. Her black boyfriend of that fall had taught her to express it this way, and he had also taught her to sing, and to ball. I'm feeling a lot better. I guess I was mainly depressed because I lost my job. What do you do? I'm a waitress. I don't believe I'm here in the room with you. It's like a dream, I never met anyone like you before. It is for me too. I was really getting to hate New York. Seems like I came all this way just to talk to someone like you. There's nothing happening up where I come from. Somehow he managed to sit on the edge of the bed without making it into a major operation. Encouraged by a kind of sigh that was on the verge of her expressing it, he leaned over as she had planned and had the first adult kiss of his adolescent life. Afterwards a heavy wave of fatigue engulfed Winslow, but he sat on the old couch near the window to look at the ads. His mood was blurry until he saw the Swan ad, which appeared identically in all the publications, Death Records will audition songwriters February 5th at Condor Studios bring tapes, MS, singer amplifiers and keyboards at studio. He reached to the valise where there was a red pencil and circled this, then fell into a long heavy sleep. Swan was offended by musical klutzery, and he had been exposed to a lot of it over the past several hours. He was through being amused with Philbin's plastic hippie clothes and the endless line of no-talent kids. So when Winslow Leach arrived Swan was not put off by his ill-fitted jeans, bad hair and ugly spectacles. Swan heard the bravura note in his playing, the oblivious confidence of genius. He also heard the irrevocable one-octave voice, and knew nothing could be done about this. But the music tickled a place in his spine. A difficult place to reach, by massage, acupuncture or anything at all. He was tickled by Winslow's virginity, his primal and total ignorance of social reality, how to kiss ass. That ass needed to be kissed in this particular business. We gotta talk about Annette, said Philbin. She doesn't remember anything we did for her. Who took her out of the choir? Got her club dates. Paid off the columnists. Told her who to be nice to. Who to screw. 
where to get her uppies for the road tours. Now, she's cancelling. She cancelled Vegas. After all I done for her, the little whore is cancelling, and she's gonna do free tours for gook orphans. Listen, insisted Swan. Listen to this music. Yeah, but he looks terrible and his voice breaks like a spitball. Listen. She's at the top of the charts. Annette is nothing. Finished. Dead, at least, let me listen, will you, Arnold? This is the music to open the paradise. That creep? The song was over, and Winslow looked up to the bright lights of the overhead sound booth questioningly. Swan removed a white-gloved hand from his chin and nodded. Go on, he whispered into the studio microphone. Winslow went immediately into the slow pretty tune Phoenix liked so well. Out of place as a crying clown who can only frown, and the play went on for hours. He sang it well, but his voice thinned out in the high notes, as always. What do we do with him? asked Philbin. You'll think of something, said Swan with finality. When the song was finished Swan rose from his seat and before Winslow looked around the booth was empty. He felt his first sickening lurch of unease. He knew he had been on. Right on. Even his voice had behaved. But the booth was empty. He put his music slowly into the plastic bag and walked dejectedly to the exit door. He was vaguely aware that all the other songwriters had gone. He was the last. Was that bad luck, he wondered. A quiet, evil mood came over him without his noticing, an anger that his music might not be heard. But at the other side of the door Philbin waited in his safari jacket, Australian hat, patched jeans and army boots. Ah, Mr. Leach. My name's Philbin, Arnold Philbin. I scout talent for Mr. Swan, and he's interested in your music. Winslow switched the plastic bag from his right to left hand and grasped Philbin's large paw seriously. He put his bag on the nearby piano top. He liked it. I thought he left. He did, but he said your sound could be real big. He said that? Well, kid, I was sitting right next to him. He closed his eyes and told me to shut up. You got your tapes with you? Winslow stopped awkwardly, feeling the perverse weight of Philbin's personality, not liking it, but trying not to react. No, said Winslow. But my opera is here. Almost all of it. Philbin was put off, but he concealed it perfectly. That's great, Winslow. Actually we just need a few of the tunes. Like your up numbers basically. Well, I guess you don't understand. What I have here is an opera, it will take three LPs. It's not just tunes. It's based on the Faust legend. Philbin leaned against the wall, and Winslow seemed to grow taller. What group's he with, this Faust? You don't understand. He's a legendary magician who sold his soul to the devil for worldly success and power. Philbin stood away from the wall peevishly. What is this, school time? A song's a song, you like it or you don't. Now we like your stuff, and we're gonna have the juicy fruits doing it. The juicy fruits. A mindless pain ripped through Winslow, as Philbin reached for the plastic bag containing the manuscripts, the pain of leaving his mother and friends, his fear and scorn of the crowds, the pain of having his music misunderstood exactly as it had been back home in Dunphy. Philbin's mouth became the mouth of Alex Smith, who had dripped syrup into Winslow's electric piano years before. He shoved Philbin away from the bag and sent him crashing back against the cork wall. It's off. You must be deaf. You must be crazy, shouted Winslow. Philbin was amazed, but he realized that if he blew the deal Swan would do something terrible to him, something unimaginable. He cooled his instinctive responses to Winslow's temper. Besides, Philbin prided himself on being a born dealmaker. Relax, kid, it was just an idea. Mr. Swan makes the decisions, not me. I'm sorry, said Winslow, suddenly embarrassed. I'm not really interested in money. You're right about that, kid, said Philbin soberly. I'll tell Mr. Swan exactly what you told me when I show him the music. If you ask me, we're gonna do your triple album just the way you want it. Here's my card. You got a card? No. I'm at the Allen. It's in the phone book. My room doesn't have a phone, so they'll take your call. Good deal, said Philbin, and left with the plastic bag before Winslow could think of anything more to say. It was a long walk back to the Allen, 
but Winslow didn't notice. The fact that he had pleased Swan excited him so much that he forgot Philbin. Nor did he notice the slush forming in the streets, or the occasional faces. It was early afternoon, there were no crowds, and after taking his bearings, he strode down Park Avenue as if he were back home in Dunphy, blundering into people from time to time, and apologizing politely. Music was coming to him from somewhere, and he was notating it in his perfect eidetic memory, to be deposited in a cassette when he got to the hotel. Even while stopping in a luncheonette on 14th Street for donuts, the music in his head continued. It stopped, though, when he got to his room and found Phoenix gone. He was quite amazed because, in his experience, girls always had done what he wanted, and he wanted Phoenix to be around to hear the good news and more of his music. There was only a note pinned to the couch. Winslow had to go with George. I guess you can understand. I have to start singing again too. I hope you're not mad. George and I have been together a long time. I hope you're not mad about any else else either. Best of luck at the auditions. Phoenix. He had been in New York long enough to know he was lucky his electric piano and his clothes were still in the room. It wasn't until an hour later that he realized he had left one pocket full of money for his stay. He checked his old jeans and the money was gone. Winslow had a very definite feeling Phoenix would have stayed if she hadn't found the $150 in his pants. So, for the second time in a day Winslow felt the desire to hit something, to fling himself free of something he couldn't define. A brief, sad groan came out of his belly. Why hadn't she told him she was a singer? Why? Why hadn't he asked? He remembered the smooth lightness of her voice and the fact that it had gone up and done at least three octaves and a half with no strain. Shit a goddamn, he said at last, with feeling. The wave of frustration passed as he got to his piano. Since the manuscript he had given Philbin was incomplete, he flung himself into finishing it, leaving the room only to go up to the donut place every so often. He remembered to tell Ms. Kasatsa at the desk that he would be getting a call from one Arnold Philbin or Mr. Allen D. Swan, and that he would take the call at any time of the day or night, whenever. Toward the end of the week, when the opera was pretty much complete, he began to place calls to death records, but both Swan and Philbin were on the coast and could not be reached. The girl who answered the phone didn't know any more than Winslow. Swan and Philbin were indeed in L.A., and then they were in Chicago, and several other places, and their return to New York was heralded by Rolling Stone, among other magazines. Crawdaddy had inside information, Swan was casting some kind of monster production that would require many people and musicians, and which would be a total break with his incredibly successful musical past. In his hotel room, slowly running out of money, Winslow Leach released a sigh of relief. He had had plenty of time to remember his failure to leave Philbin a card, nor was his address on the manuscript. He had broken his rule about being businesslike in the service of his music. The same rule, he understood, which had been broken by leaving his money around to tempt Phoenix. He suspected now that Phoenix may have been strung out, a term he learned at the hotel. He had forgiven her, though. He didn't give a damn, now that Swan was back, and he was in the shower after his second reading of the article. After the shower he put on his navy blue suit pants, thermal underwear, black sneakers, and a large black cape he had bought for $10, on the advice of a bass player down the hall who had told him he needed some image. To top this off he had a leather cap he had found in the lobby and taken with no thoughts of thievery, because it completed the dramatic effect. He arrived at Swan's estate in these new clothes to find himself walking more and more slowly, completely taken in by the enormity of the place. Swanage filled a large city block in a fine residential area just off the Hudson River, the whole thing enclosed by eight-foot stone walls, within which existed a many-turreted castle, housing recording studios, offices, guards, quarters, gardens and pools, all imposingly gothic. He found an incredible line of mostly girls inside the walls waiting to see the master, who was already casting his new production. He stood patiently in the street at the end of this line while his sneakers grew icy, and then an outrageously beautiful thing occurred. As he shifted his position to improve the view, he saw that Phoenix was in the line behind him, they both gasped, and she dropped her eyes in embarrassment. It's all right about the money, he said. I think I understand, I just didn't know about George. I was thinking about your voice all the while you were away. 
That's nice of you, Winslow, she said, suddenly understanding him, and even liking him. George can't get along without me. I can't get along without your voice, Phoenix. Why didn't you say you were a singer? You scared me, Winslow. The line moved, and they were in the entrance to the building, being observed by members of a local biker's gang, all employed by Swan and larger in muscle and bone than Philbin, and quite rank with old sweat. Who are they? They don't look like they belong in a place like this, said Winslow. They go wherever Swan goes, to protect him. God damn, said Winslow, like his father. Then he was at the desk talking to a girl with huge shapely breasts that hung out for all to see in what Winslow thought was a cheap manner. She checked his name in a Rolodex and found this legend, not to be seen or encouraged. Girls only today, she said. Look, I'm Winslow Leach, the composer. Mr. Swan is producing my work, and I have to see him. It's a mistake if my name isn't on your list. Only way you'll see him this week is to be a girl. Winslow was fuddled, but thought about what the girl had said. He turned to Phoenix, shrugged his large bony shoulders and went downtown to a cheap department store, where he bought a dress and veil with some of his last money, and stopped by his room to pick up a sheet of music paper, since all the girls had one of these. Looking no stranger than some of the others, he was allowed through the entrance into a big 19th century room with a long winding staircase leading up to the next level. It struck him like a movie set, but this was much less important to him than hearing his song being sung in various keys by all these different girls, none of whom could sing, apparently. He was giddy and confused, but also pleased in a very limited way. Looking for Phoenix, he realized she had passed already to an inner room. Swan's room. The door opened and a guard motioned to what was left of the line, we've got to step it up. The next six of you, come on in. This group included Winslow, who walked in humming his song to see an enormous golden waterbed with half a dozen semi-clothed girls lolling and laughing under a soft light. There was a vague strange smell in the air, and it was obvious even to Winslow that it would be an odd audition. But he retained a clear image of Swan's face in the booth at Condor Studios. An intelligent, forbearing face, the face of a man who might have quirks but had no need to take advantage of composers. Winslow didn't care what he did with women. He joined the group of girls on the waterbed, all of whom were unaware of anything strange about him, being very preoccupied with what would soon be happening for them, they hoped. Winslow listened rather happily, pleased that he had finally broken through the idiot surrounding Swan. He wanted first of all to explain the numerous revisions and additions to his opera Foster, and hoped Swan had not gone ahead into production with the rough draft. He intended to be firm about who would sing what, and had decided that, he could have an effect without going through any miseries about his limited voice. The truth was, he intensely liked Swan for having recognized his genius, and didn't think it likely that such a man could go far wrong. Meanwhile he listened to the girls. When do we get to sing? I don't think much singing goes on here, I've been here twelve times and I never get to sing. All I get is to come back. What do you do here? You'll see, said several voices in chorus. Can you sing on your back? I've never tried. If you can sing standing, you can sing lying down. Why don't you take off your slip? Winslow smiled to himself, thinking that even he knew what this was about. And the strange smell was probably dope. I'm saving myself for Swan. He won't miss anything. We're being auditioned right now, the whole place is bugged. He likes to watch us. Watch us what? Doing each other. That's what turns him on. Does he like blondes? I like blondes. I hate to bother you, but it might do us both some good. Yeah, like that, it warms up my voice. Oh yeah? Really? Temperatures began to rise, particularly Winslow's, as bodies and voices overlapped. Several girls began to fondle each other and Winslow put his face to the waterbed to smother his laugh. A hand from somewhere traveled gently up and down his back, when suddenly a door opened and Swan walked in wearing his brown robe, followed by a puff of vapor exhaled from his steam bath. From another door one of the leather-clad biker guards entered to make sure things were under control. He stood back with an extremely blank look on his broad face as if there were no mass of squirming ladies ten feet in front of him. 
Winslow bounded smiling from the middle of this, an erection marring the fall of his dress. Mr. Swan, it's me, Winslow Leach. I've just been going through all kinds of trouble trying to reach you and Mr. Philbin. He was about to congratulate Swan on his unusual living arrangements but Swan seemed barely aware of him. His small feline face was petulant. Get this faggot out of here, he said to the guard, who seized Winslow very professionally, and was suddenly joined by another guard who helped carry him away. It was over in a moment, but the day was spoiled for Swan. Have Arnold talk to Sonny after you're through, he said to the guard as they were exiting. Tell him I don't want this again. On the way out through a back door the bikers transported Winslow ungently by his arms, which were bent up behind his back. Out in the night of the courtyard he was deposited nose forward with bored efficiency. Before he could move he was jumped on and cursed at, as with minority group members being questioned by police. Most of the work was done by boot, until the bikers could see that he was sufficiently dazed and damaged to stay put. Then he was put in a quiet adjacent residential street near a neat stack of garbage. You better leave Mr. Swan alone, kid, said the biker in command, voicing it like an army non-com. Yeah, you could get hurt messin' with Mr. Swan, he's an important guy. Both laughed in a not unfriendly way, knowing that Winslow would recover though it might take a few days. They stood back and admired their handiwork a minute or so and then left. See ya, said the senior biker. Almost immediately two police arrived, one black and one white. They came up the block to Winslow without hesitation. Hey kid, what are ya stoned or what, said the white one. Yeah, he stoned, said the black one with quiet emphasis. Then he dropped a condom of heroin into the purse that Winslow had brought to complete his costume. The irony was lost on Winslow who didn't know what it was, nor actually who he was because it was manifestly impossible for this to happen to him, Winslow Leach, a quiet and sincere musician who had one simple intent in life, to get his music heard. He was conscious that there were men in blue uniforms, that he was bleeding from nose and mouth, that various joints were sprained or separated, and that there was no help for him from these two. But at the same time these obvious facts were inconceivable, and the result was an autistic blob that repeated, I'm Winslow Leach the composer, over and over, quietly, as if nothing had happened. What are you, some kind of pervert, asked the white cop, observing Winslow's dress. What you doing here by the swanage? Grunted the black one. You don't understand, I need your help, Swan's got my music and he's pretending he doesn't know me. For a moment Winslow was lucid as he got this out, but it was ignored. Didn't want what you was selling, did he, mused the black. He never even talked about that, what do you mean? He slid back into dazed confusion and was kicked in the belly by the white cop. The black reached into the purse and pulled out the condom of heroin. He opened it and took a bit on his finger to taste. Just like Mr. Swan said. Smack, Jack. And because what was happening was impossible, the outrage to Winslow's logical mind was worse than the outrage to his physical body, with which he wasn't much concerned. He did not even allow himself to understand that his music had been stolen with no hope of retribution. Guess we gotta take this junkie in, said the white cop, in a Mott Street accent. And they did, and he was processed with the alarming speed with which set-up paid-off cases are processed. In spite of his obvious mental blankness the judge arranged for him to go to prison. That was the deal by New York state law, life imprisonment for possession of narcotics in quantity with intent to sell. With Winslow out of the way, Swan went into production of several songs in Winslow's opera, which he recognized as an interesting but very flawed work. In any case there didn't seem to be a market for three record sets of rock operas by anonymous composers. He didn't think about Winslow. That was one of his strong points, one of the secrets of his marvelous success. He accepted the rules of the game, one of which was not looking back, not remembering anything counterproductive. To expose his very sensitive mind to morbid recriminations about Winslow Leach would have been an enormous waste of his energy and talent. During the short time he had thought seriously about Winslow, about. For minutes in the control room at Condor, he had seen the hopeless inflexibility of the boy's mind as a fait accompli. Another rule was that pop musicians must be infinitely flexible, like the juicy fruits, while maintaining the opposite image. He had seen Winslow as a completely untalented liar. And without a voice. 
and unable to compromise. This had checked out precisely with Philbin's tale of Winslow rejecting the juicy fruits for his opera. But it was all behind, as everything quickly was in Swan's clinically detached world, and he went on very quickly to fulfill the Juicy Fruits contractual obligations with two of Winslow's songs, backed by some old things left over from previous sessions. People were paid off, reviewers paid due respect, and the sides appeared on the charts as they were expected to do. One of the songs got to number three and stayed there a good long time, Swan was sorry that he had, after all, only five Winslow Leach songs he was sure about, plus a few others he wasn't so sure about. We do need a writer, Arnold. It's still a problem, he said, as they sat in the steam bath. Watching Philbin's paunch and hanging eyes he thanked fate for having given him a more attractive and longer-lasting body. And mind, he added to himself. No way that kid was gonna go along, said Philbin, for whom the steam bath was a necessary terror. He was literally pouring sweat, though he never lost weight. He was thinking about Winslow now, specifically, he was remembering being shoved back against the studio wall as Winslow snatched away his manuscript from desecration by the fruits. There was a mild, somewhat sentimental affection in this memory, because Winslow had genuinely surprised him, which didn't happen often. It was as close as Philbin could get to appreciating genius. The genius in question was doing badly in prison. Though he had not been raped, there had been a series of violent incidents revealing and developing that violent aspect of Winslow which had surprised Arnold Philbin. Winslow knew his name, and could move about from place to place as necessary, eat, sleep, shit and so forth, but the beating, and jailing, the robbery of his music and now austening prison had turned Winslow's sense of himself into a tiny unfamiliar new area. He was all but mad, the only thing that kept him from being obviously incoherent was the ingrained practicality of his ancestry and training. His memory had been warped and battered by the blatant impossibilities of the last two months. He, he had only a vague sense that he was a young musician from Dunphy, Maine, who had been suddenly and violently fucked over by a very dangerous man for no particularly good reason. He now understood himself as a man working in the kitchen of a state prison, he was concerned with avoiding dangerous, unpleasant people, working out all his spare time in the gymnasium, the better to defend himself. He was also concerned with behaving well, so as to build up good time. This would let him be out of prison sooner, and he would then get a job of the type suggested by the guidance person he saw bi-weekly for 10-minute sessions. This person simply could not believe any of Winslow's story, and had even convinced Winslow that he had a very dangerous talent for hallucination, the runaway tongue of a pathological liar. This man wished to place Winslow in retail sales, and Winslow cooperated blindly, being too incoherent in his own mind to explain himself, even to himself. In his fourth month, just as the prison was growing snug around him, just as he was learning how to sleep away all the time not spent in the kitchen or gymnasium, he heard Talia Farrow's transistor radio in the next cell playing his song, Wheelin' Dealin'. It was late at night, and the music was very soft because it was against the rules to play it at that hour, but Winslow jumped awake from a sound sleep understanding exactly what had happened, and who and where he was. His mind was suddenly very clear. A sound came out of him, a low but very penetrating sound that Talia Farrow heard. Thinking it was an angry guard, he turned off the radio, leaving the place to silence, and with the juicy fruits echoing in Winslow's reconstituted mind. Winslow's body would not be still on his cot. He locked it there in his own grip as waves of cathartic understanding and misunderstanding rushed down from his brain. He held the metal bar at the head of the bed, afraid to make a noise and give himself away in this naked mood. But in the bunk above, Charles Otis was well aware of the problem. He was a history professor who had poisoned his wife and had disposed of the bottle in a coma trash can, where it had been found the next day. When Winslow asked him the next day if he would put him in one of the outgoing cartons from the license plate department, he smiled and said, of course, Winslow. But that's very dangerous. Winslow didn't mind. Otis not only managed to do this, but got hold of a hammer and crowbar with which Winslow could smash his way out of the truck, and $70 too. When Winslow jumped from the truck 30 miles from Ossining, he headed into the woods of upstate New York, which were very like the woods of Maine. It was a hot August day and there were no real problems. In the woods he became calm for the first time since his February walk in Skilton's Meadow. 
His memory, which had always been close to perfect until the beating at Swans, reintegrated itself, but in the process certain experiences were eliminated. Nothing specifically unpleasant was remembered, including the beating in his prison experience. As during that earlier walk in the meadow, there was a great simplification, things he hadn't been able to deal with were sweepingly decided, and a calm clear mood followed. The main thing was that his music had to be rescued, and he felt it could be done somehow, although he didn't have any plan of how to accomplish this. There would be a way. Swan somehow wasn't very important. Swan was just a businessman, like Winslow's father, who did what he had to do like a wind-up doll. Winslow allowed that Swan had discrimination, he had appreciated the music, and he was brutal, but so was Wagner, in his way, not to mention Beethoven or Mick Jagger. And Philbin was a fat pawn. Shortly there was a plan. He would simply blow up Swan's operation, which was all located in the enormous Manhattan townhouse complex facing the Palisades. Even the record-pressing plant was there. The weightlifting and karate in the prison gym had induced a thick-witted directness and confidence which lifted this moment of decision into a very happy area. Swan would soon know he was dealing with a person not to be trifled with. As Winslow trudged through the woods he thought of a letter to Swan, but this seemed superfluous. Swan would know. It was elegant, like a bold chord transition, naked of melody. After walking some 18 miles in the woods he arrived at Croton, where he took a bus to New York. Several days later Winslow had stolen close to a thousand dollars from a clothing store on the Upper West Side, had bought a dime store organ and was simultaneously revising Foster and investigating Swan, specifically, he was finding out how to get inside the pressing plant. He was also spending time at the 42nd Street Library learning how to make explosives, but eventually he bought 20 guaranteed sticks of dynamite from some black revolutionists in the East Village who needed capital for their cocaine business. They didn't try cheating him, sensing his madness and inspiration, and having no immediate use for the dynamite. Ah uh, no you gonna do something serious with this equipment, said the head brother after receiving his $200. Winslow's serious unblinking nod convinced him he was right, and they parted on respectful terms. Afterwards in a lengthy discussion he explained to his partner that here was one whitey who was no jive bullshit. Winslow's eyes had impressed him, and he had smelled the jail experience. But when he tried to call Winslow regarding a bargain machine gun, he found the telephone number was non-existent. Winslow had learned his lessons at Ossining thoroughly. Besides covering his tracks, Winslow had learned how, when and where to gain entry to locked buildings. He had learned to dress the way people in a particular neighborhood dress, to move quickly and quietly, and how to check for alarm systems. As it happened, the alarm system at the Death Records pressing plant was very primitive, Swan preferred guards to electronic systems, because people in his business would understand electronics only too well. There was no difficulty getting in. At 4 a.m. Winslow found the street empty and vaulted to the top of a brick wall guarding the courtyard. One of the bikers was on duty, but he was standing dumbly in the warm moonlit night smoking a cigarette, looking at a window behind which Swan and Philbin were bawling a large, wild black-haired girl from Alabama. The biker's penis was standing brightly forward and so was his complete attention as he stroked his member thoughtfully, hoping he might get the girl later. He fell like a log when Winslow sapped him and was shortly trussed into a tight bundle, one of his leather gloves stuffed into his mouth and held there with adhesive tape. Then Winslow, attaché case in hand, climbed a small fruit tree to an unprotected window, which he taped carefully and then delicately smashed. During all this he had a quietly euphoric expression, and the calm decisiveness that came over him in his strong moments. Inside the plant he talked to himself quietly as he looked around for the most crucial equipment, two charges, he said. No, one will go off first and spoil the other. He opened a carton and took a record to the window, where there was more light. Wheelin' dealin', it read, and he flashed angrily. Then he decided to slide the cartons over to the presser, and place the charge so that both would be destroyed. But the machine itself fascinated him. It was brand new, and had the virginal perfection of a new instrument. There was an operating console alongside it, and he could not resist pressing the start button. There was a faint hum, but nothing seemed to happen. He lost his sense of time as he listened to some faint automated clicks and watched the two sides of the press, which ought to be coming together. It's heating up, he thought then he pressed the stop button, but the machine continued to hum faintly as the plates heated. 
He stepped forward to look at this phenomenon before getting down to business. Behind him, unheard, his steps masked by the hum of the press, another biker guard approached, a length of pipe at the ready. But just as he was about to apply it, Winslow's keen ear sensed his presence. He turned, off balance, and the biker missed his blow, stumbling forward with the overswing and falling against Winslow, whose face was shoved against the hot steel plate slowly moving toward its mate. He screamed and withdrew, but not before a squirt of hot vinyl had splashed the burn. The biker climbed up to finish Winslow and was astounded to receive a heavy chop across his nose while glimpsing the burned cheekbone with its congealing vinyl. Then Winslow darted away, blinded on his left side but with a feral quickness, and was on his way out the window before the guard could get a shot off. The shot went through the inside of Winslow's thigh, but he was gone. The guard followed, and continued following to the wall, which he didn't quite clear. Fuck said the guard, fucking son of a bitch. Winslow ran. He flew over the wall and on toward the river, blind and crazy with pain and fear. Straight to the river, where he plunged in, shoes and all, quite mad but still alive and free. He swam as well as he could until he came to a sandy place where he could pull himself out, and he lay there a while, afraid to touch the raw left side of his face. On the way into his hotel, he was relieved to see an empty lobby. He kept his face turned away from the clerk, who was used to eccentrics, it was that kind of hotel. Mad Toonsmith bites bullet it said in Variety that week, Alan Swan of Death Records has identified the intruder into his pressing plant as one Winslow Leach, a drug addict songwriter escapee from Ossining Prison. Leach had previously attempted entry to Swanage, Swan's private home, located on the same grounds as the plant, and Swan recognized him during the break-in. Leach apparently vaulted an eight-foot wall and leaped into the Hudson River, severely wounded by a guard. His body was not recovered. Swan expressed the deepest regret for the incident and said that Leach, while obviously not sane, was honestly and purely devoted to his music in a way that could be an example to any serious artist. And it was true that Swan was very affected by the incident. He had broken away from the sex play with the dark-haired lady and Philbin out of pure intuition. When he realized the courtyard man was not on duty, he had sent another to check the plant. And while he had not seen Winslow, he hadn't needed to. He had called the prison immediately and had been told of the escape. But Swan was a busy man, and he had a certain fatalism along with the don't look back philosophy. Winslow Leach had been too pure, too idealistic, and much too infantile for this world, a peculiar child of God, ill fitted to the music business, and now relieved of his misery. Swan felt somewhat indebted to him in that Winslow's music had solved the problem of something special for opening the Paradise, Swan's huge theater in downtown Manhattan. The opening was scheduled for two weeks after Winslow's obituary, and the karmic implications, while not pleasant, provided an effective underground promotion among further out occult fans who would be unaffected by the regular press releases. In fact, the crowds at the Paradise surprised even Swan, who cruised by with Philbin in the limousine a couple of hours after tickets went on sale. The line was wound around the block, though the opening was weeks away. Another sellout, he said quietly. We owe this to Winslow, you know. Isn't it odd, such an impractical person having such a commercial impact? It's just what he wanted, too. Except for who's doing his music, said Philbin after a respectful pause. Boy, that kid didn't like the fruits at all. No one does, Philbin, no one with any taste or intelligence. But that's not up to us. So much of this isn't up to us. It's just there. The limousine pulled up to the West Broadway entrance and a following car with four bikers stopped behind it. The bikers jumped out, broke forcefully into the line, and before the dope-smoking kids were fully aware, Alan Swan had passed through into a side entrance to supervise rehearsals. Inside he went directly to a box overlooking the stage and sat with Philbin. In the wing stagehands killed time drinking beer and looking over the many beautiful girls lined up at the bottom of the stairs in their pasties. In the prop room Winslow was hidden behind racks of ancient costumes, no plan in mind, but with four sticks of dynamite left from his previous purchase taped together into an innocent looking brown package. He was obsessed with the ugliness of his scarred face, which he had disguised as best he could with makeup. His plan was to locate Swan, fire the dynamite and rush up to him for a simple murder-suicide. 
He ran his fingers along the ridges on his ruined left cheekbone and felt tears beginning to form in his good right eye. He was pervaded by weakness at the thought of his own death, and the death of the music still inside him. Securely hidden, he sat for a long time, he dozed, he woke to wrestle with his problem again. He ate a ham and cheese sandwich from a local bodega and four hostess Twinkies and then drank one of several cans of Coke he had bought. The food and drink helped, and he found himself standing up, looking the room over, then the costumes, which brought thoughts of Foster, some of whose butchered parts would soon be presented here by Swan and the juicy fruits if he didn't act. Finally, he spotted a silver helmet with a beak-like visor that appealed to him. He put it on and went to the mirror. It covered his scar. Then he found a black cape and leather riding outfit something like that worn by Swan's biker guards, and took it behind the mass of costumes to change into. When this was done, he felt more decisive and clever, and the idea of suicide had vanished. It now seemed to him that of all the people in the theater he was probably the only one with anything genuine to contribute to civilization, and destroying himself would be silly. He looked at his new self with adolescent pride, thinking that with some kind of luck he would find the money to repair his damaged face, and that it was time to get on with things somehow. He listened at the door and heard some stagehands talking. We've got to get that heap on stage before the last act, Billy. Yeah, I know, but we've got half an hour. I kicked her over this afternoon, she runs okay. Let's go up on the roof and smoke AJ. You got it, said the first, and after a pause Winslow heard them leave. Then silence for a minute. With his musician's ears Winslow scanned the silence and was quite sure there was no one else in that section of the theater. He knew also that the stagehands had been talking about an old touring car he had seen on the lower level. He opened one end of his brown package and set the timer for 35 minutes, then opened the door a crack. The hall was empty, but when he got to the top of the stairs leading down to the first level he saw the cluster of girls and paused. Then he went to the other end of the passage, unscrewing bulbs as he went, and saw the old car at the bottom of a flight of stairs, with only one person near it, a comatose stagehand sitting with his back against a front wheel and smoking a joint. This person was taken from behind, an ether-soaked rag clamped over his face by Winslow's large powerful hands. He subsided in half a minute. Winslow shoved the bomb into the trunk of the touring car and flew back up the stairs to see what would happen. What happened was nothing at all, but a few minutes later the two other stagehands came down from the roof to find their friend asleep. They woke him with difficulty, and he seemed very stoned to them. Man, this is no place to be smoking, said one of the roofgoers. Yeah, said his friend stressfully. No shit, Jerry. Somebody smothered me, said Jerry. Fuck somebody smothered you, said the first stagehand, a large simple type. Fuck you. Somebody came up behind me and smothered me. You get robbed, asked the other roofgoer. Jerry reached for his wallet and felt it where it belonged. I guess not. You're fucking hallucinatin from that formaldehyde weed. Winslow backed slowly away as the conversation went on, until the days Jerry happened to see a bit of light reflected off the visor of Winslow's helmet. He gasped in a spasm of fear as Winslow slipped away, and the reflection was gone. It took a number of seconds before Jerry could voice anything. There's something up there, he managed finally, in a low shaken voice. The others turned and saw nothing, but caught his fear. Man, maybe you ought to take a couple of reds or something, you don't look too good. Said the large simple one. Winslow was now well away from the top of the stairwell, moving quickly and quietly along the blacked out corridor and off to a place above the other wing. He wanted to see Swan's reaction when the bomb went off, but there was time for that later. As he peered down he saw that in the time he had taken to circle around overhead, the word was out. Philbin was below, one large arm blocking the passage of Willie Peru, head of the Juicy Fruits. Where do you think you're going, said Philbin in his Jersey manner. I gotta get out for a while, replied the singer. Say, look man, what sign are you, man? Taurus. What the hell has that got to do with you skip pin rehearsal? It means you're an alright person. You can understand. I gotta go out for a minute. I know my fucking part for Christ's sake. I'm just not supposed to ride in cars today, that's what it said in my horoscope. News and post both. 
He turned to leave but the arm remained like a poised club. Philbin raised it slowly to point up into the boxes. Swan is up in number seven. He don't show it, but he knows you ain't on yet. If you don't get the fuck on you'll go for a ride like we used to have in the old days, Willie. Now here's something, to calm you down. What the hell is both Aaron, you anyway? Nothing, just some guy tried to kill a stagehand in the other wing. Then he was gone, prancing on stage with a nasal squeal. The herd of pretty ladies, in pasties appeared from somewhere, split into a singing group and a dancing contingent, all loosening up muscles and vocal cords under the appreciative eyes of bikers and stagehands. Winslow was in a fury to think that his work was being shat upon in this manner, and suddenly his jaw dropped as he stared at one of the singer's group. It was Phoenix. Six dimwit trash screamers and Phoenix. He was stopped for a moment, paralyzed by a very unfamiliar sensation compounded of surprise, sentiment, a sense of time passing and simple protectiveness. He listened carefully and made her voice clear in his mind from the rest. It was a fine smooth sensitive sound, and the words came through like her own, artless, direct and perfect. He forgot the bomb, the car. Swan and everything else. He was in love, standing flat-foot and absent-minded as he listened and watched. Then a rumbling. The car. Winslow came alive and shivered with confused fear, but before he had a chance to do anything, Philbin was herding the singers off to a rehearsal room. The dancers climbed onto the hood of the car in a grotesque imitation of a Busby Berkeley production group, and the car rolled to stage center where they bounded off to join the Juicy Fruits, who were doing a California elegy to automobiles. Carburetors, man, that's what life is all about, said one. Then they sang, I was not myself last night, ran a light without my registration where the cops were bound to see, and you know me. The ending of the chorus was punctuated by a dull powerful boom as four sticks of dynamite exploded inside the cavernous trunk of the old Packard touring car. It was a very well-made car, and the explosion simply shot off into space out the rear of the trunk, since only the lock gave way. To Swan it seemed uncannily to be aimed at him, and he was so genuinely surprised he showed no fear. The enormous room boomed with echoes from various walls, and this emptied after half a minute into a heavy frightening silence. Except for Swan, who immediately recognized Winslow's touch, everyone was struck dumb. Swan stood up and left his box without haste, thinking deeply. He realized he had shortchanged a very talented and resourceful person. A person of genius, it now seemed to Swan, who wasn't himself really happy with the production to begin with. As he walked down a corridor two of the bikers fell in behind him, when he arrived backstage everyone was dithering. He calmed them. Why don't you all go home for the day? I know how hard it is to work when things go wrong. I heard that one of the community groups was planning to do something unpleasant because we were sticking with our regular people rather than hiring the locals, and I imagine this nonsense is what they had in mind. I suppose I'll have to buy them off, but meanwhile take the rest of the day. Philbin appeared alongside and nodded his head vigorously. Well, you heard what Mr. Swan said, you're all free till 11 tomorrow, and get here on time, we got a Fakova lot to do in the next week. The group scattered, and then Swan turned to Philbin. You too, Arnold. I think I want to be alone for a while. Here, boss. You gotta be kidding me. There's a maniac loose in the place. His voice was very low, but intense. Several probably. Go home, and leave someone in the car to drive me back when I feel like leaving. Arnold Philbin was not without words when he needed them, but he understood the look he was getting from Swan, so he nodded and walked out after the others. Swan stood quietly until the voices and door slammings were over, and then he walked through the velvety silence to the stage and stood next to the car with its blasted rear. Winslow, he called, opening his voice to a firm but not unfriendly command. There was just silence after this, and a trace of echo. I know you're here. I think it's time we talked. I underestimated you, Winslow, and I stand corrected. With a faint, translucent swish a sandbag smashed down at his feet. This is nonsense, Winslow, you're a composer, not a murderer, it's a waste of your time. I'm useless to you dead, that should be obvious. There was more silence, and just the smallest sound of movement. Swan stood carefully composed, 
but with prescient awareness of what might happen behind him. But instead, a large section of the set in clear view toppled forward, and he had time to step back without rushing. As he did so he felt sure he had made his point. Winslow, I'd rather spell things out face to face. I need your music, you need my resources. I won't tamper with your work again. There's a studio upstairs where you can work with no interruption. And with this, the silence was broken, by the sound of feet coming down a long staircase. Swan was surprised again as Winslow's black and helmeted figure emerged into a bar of light, and he was delighted at all the surprises, because they assured him that Winslow did indeed have a magical quality. He was not bothered by the length of pipe in Winslow's hand. What's that you've got on your head, he asked, and as Winslow's large figure got close he reached up to tip back the helmet. Terrible, he said. We'll have to do something about that, won't we? But that's not the main thing. Winslow, I can give you the power to create again, as you never have before, with nothing in your way. All this destruction is childish. Haven't we had enough? The time for your work is here. Right now. I'd never have let Philbin handle you the way he did if I'd known. I left for the coast and he botched things between us. But here's the bottom line, Winslow. I'll put a group together to do your work your way. Trust me, Winslow, we need each other. Phoenix will sing the lead, announced Winslow. Phoenix has to play Lady Beth. Swan looked brightly attentive, and remembered the name finally. Phoenix had been kind of a bore in bed, but was in the backup group by virtue of her quick ear and professionalism. Swan nodded slowly, grew a faint smile that he deepened with an empathetic stare. Right, 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 he said, wondering if there was anything in it. The next morning Swan and Winslow sat together in a far and darkened box, while Phoenix sang two songs culled from Winslow's early version of Foster. They watched through opera glasses, and the mood was electric after the strange events of the day before. Swan was impressed, but not overwhelmed, realizing that the music was only part of the required spectacle. He wished she were half a foot taller, and a lot stranger. He lifted a microphone, Phoenix. Swan here. I want to ask you a question. The girl looked up into the darkness and nodded. Why do you want to sing? Why do you want to live? Because I must, I suppose. Me too, she replied artlessly, losing his interest. That's very good, he said, for Winslow's benefit. What would you give to sing for me? Anything you want. A ripple of earthy laughter went through cast, bikers and stagehands. Anything? It's your voice I want. Try me. She said, getting the best of it, and the weirdness of the previous day was forgotten. This taken care of, Swan escorted Winslow upstairs to the studio, a fine and private place full of large and small recorders, equalizers, echo devices. Dolby's and all the paraphernalia needed to change musical lead to gold records. It was exactly as Winslow had dreamed of it back home in Maine. I think there's anything you'll need here, Winslow. If not, you'll have it. As to what must be done, there are two things, you must get your opera on paper in its present form within five days, and also record it with voice and keyboard for clarification and emphasis. I want you to stay in this room till that's done, because after that you're going to the best plastic surgeon in the East. I don't want you to suffer through the stupidity of these people I work with, and I don't want you to meet Phoenix this way, Winslow. It could harm both of you. Still there was a flash of mad resentment in Winslow, she's too good for you. Swan. I'm too good for you as far as that goes. You butchered my music before. I heard what they did with it, your group. They suck. Yes, and they're gone too. We're turning a comer, and we're taking music with us. You can change people's taste if you're strong enough. I've done it. We're going to kill Duwa Nostalgia, right here in this room. But Winslow, I'm afraid of you too, do you ever think of that? We must sign a contract. Of course, said Winslow sarcastically. I suppose you have it with you. Of course I do. I'm committing the resources of a $20 million operation to you, and I need your commitment too. God, I do hope you can understand that. You are going to need money, for a house, for a studio in the house, to fix your face. To change your life. 
I'll kill you if this isn't fair. I know how, if I have to. I'm going to sign, but if it isn't right I will do what I have to do for my music. Swan allowed a pause for effect. Then he clarified, with an odd suppressed hotness in his voice, as if for once seriously involved. For once Winslow listened. You have no choice, nor do I, said Swan. You must be heard, and I am the one person who can make sure it's done right. Winslow heard the devil in that voice, but the devil was saying what he wanted to hear. He signed large, and handed the pen to Swan, who seized Winslow's wrist like a snake, then jabbed the ball of Winslow's index finger and pushed it down onto the contract beneath his signature. Ink isn't worth anything to me, Winslow, he said in a much, more relaxed voice. Then he pricked his own finger and pressed it onto the paper under his name. Then signed. Waves of strong, confused feeling exploded in Winslow's erratic soul. Then he forgot it all, and his expression conveyed that he was bored, that Swan was in fact impeding the work that he, Winslow Leach, had to get done so very shortly. He conveyed a trace of scorn along with this, and the contempt of artist for manipulating producer. It was all registered with a faint smile by Swan, who rose. Now we're in business, together, forever, Swan said. And it's time to get on with it. I'm going to have to throw a deadlock on the door, Winslow, not because I think you want to waste time, but because the lock was made this way. The blue button to the left of the door reaches me in my box, in the car or at Swanage, so I'm available when needed, and of course I'll be bringing you food. The bath's off to the back if you want to shower and change, and there's the couch for sleeping. Winslow shrugged, and Swan left with a clack of the bolt, returning immediately to confer with Philbin in his usual box. I got M lined up, Mr. Swan, but I thought you were gonna do it with Phoenix. I can get her for nothing, she'll sign anything we put under her nose. Oh, just let me sing, that's all I care about. One good show and she'll be another Annette. You're rambling, but you're right. She's not what we want. She lacks drama. Winslow has an amazing sense of drama, and it's very implicit in his work. Besides, she's perfect, and I abhor perfection in anyone else. Yeah, right. Well, I ain't no competition, that's for sure, all us guys from Jersey are kinda rough. Yes. By the way, Arnold, I've been thinking we need a really tough male voice for this thing. Something sexually confused that these idiots can identify with. Phoenix is all the way out then, huh? No, sign her, get her locked up. We'll give her something, but not the lead. Now get down there and start running them through. I hate this part of it, and we have absolutely no time at all. We need a decision in the next 40 hours, and even at that we're going to have problems. Gotcha, boss, said Philbin, and went down to the wings to start the process as Swan sat alone with a biker behind him, smoking many cigarettes and dictating into a tiny cassette. The artists got from one to four minutes, and there were a tremendous lot of them, all unsigned unknowns. The variety was incredible, but Swan was unaffected. None was nearly as mad as Winslow required, they were simply singers, good, bad and indifferent. He milked his patients and assigned them ratings from 1 to 10. None got higher than 6 with a question mark, and the day went on. Seven hours went by without a break, and finally something interesting arrived, an enormous bisexual muscle beach type with a jewel-encrusted guitar. The guitar was an old Les Paul model with some remarkable modifications including custom-built triple pickups with naked contacts and bare wires. Beef, Swan dictated into the machine. Looks good, sophisticated. Bisexual, perfect. He was cut off by a very incisive guitar chord blasting from this remarkable guitar. It was the first player who had managed that opening chord properly. The voice matched, hysterical, yet professional as if Beef had spent a very long time in some isolated place screaming at the wilderness. The voice went quite far down with power, and the falsetto was solid. Maniacal. It went up, 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 but finally cracked as they all had. Fearlessly this Beef person looked up at Swan. You better get yourself a castrato for this because it's a little out of my range, he lisped. Something bothering you, replied Swan vaguely into his mic. I liked what you were doing with it. This was written for a chick, and I'm not in drag yet, as you can see. 
You know you can sing it better than any bitch, said Philbin. The juicy fruits, tentatively having become the heavies for this operation, laughed in the background. Beef whacked a cord out. Is that so? You don't know how right you are, Tubbo. He turned to the fruits, nodded, and started again, and they got almost through the song until Beef stopped. Swan saw that Beef already had Willie and the group under control. Beef spoke toward the box again. Well maybe so. Cut a line here, drop an octave on that middle part. I can sing the sweet ass off it, if you want to know. You've got it. Do what you have to do with it. Philbin will get you the rest of the material. Make it your own. I'm very concerned that you do it the way you hear it. Far out, said Beef mildly, realizing he was really and truly in. But doesn't that kinda change the concept? Philbin's rough voice broke in again. You heard what he said, make it yours. As long as it sounds good no one's going to care what it's about. Oh, yeah, I like you, said Beef. No one cares what anything's about, and who the hell understands lyrics anyhow. Dry up, Tubbo. This is good stuff, and when I get through it will be great stuff. Yes, came Swan's voice. He had turned off his recorder. The audition's over. We are going directly into rehearsal on the material we now have. The rest will be here by Thursday. I am leaving for the day, and when I come back I want to hear and see at least three numbers. If anyone has trouble staying awake, see Philbin. You'll all get overtime and double overtime depending on how long it takes to work things out. He looked at his watch then, and sent a biker in the hall to get some food for Winslow. Then he stopped by to have a word with Philbin, who already had beef huddled with the juicy fruits working on the songs. Pretty sensational, don't you think? Pretty freaky too, said Philbin, but with a pleased expression, because he understood that it was very difficult to look away from the imperious beef, which Philbin knew was the name of the game. Two world-class talents working together. Three, including myself, said Swan as they stood in an alcove, given lots of room by the cast and stagehands. As long as the other two don't meet, you know what I mean, muttered Philbin. Arnold, when will you stop doubting? We always come out on top, don't we? Well, I'm off. Incidentally, you ought to know that Winslow was our phantom, and that he's working quietly for us in the studio up on the third level. That area is off limits naturally, since we have a dead man in our employ. The union would never accept that. But seriously, it's an absolute secret. Not a breath, eh? Philbin nodded. They talked about production scheduling and the biker returned with a brown bag full of delicatessen food. With the biker in tow, Swan went up to the third level. When he got to the corner leading to the studio he looked at the man solidly. I've got a very special job for you. You're going to stay right here, at this corner. I want no one to go into this corridor, and I want no one to go out. No guns or knives, but no one goes by you in either direction. Philbin tells me you can handle this. I know it's boring, so you get a bonus. He peeled off a hundred dollar bill and gave it to the man, who nodded respectfully. Someone will relieve you in twelve hour shifts so you can get your share of girls. But no one passes this point, either direction. In the room, though, Winslow had no thoughts of leaving. He had sung all of the first two acts into a tape machine and was grinding away at the score for that part, which he remembered perfectly. It was coming easily, and he was as happy as he could ever remember being, as if the enormous load of his obsession with Foster had begun to slide off his back at last. When the bolt clacked, signaling Swan's return, he was faintly irritated. Sealed off completely from anything but his music, and with the air conditioner maintaining a constant temperature, his sense of time had slipped away. He had no idea he had been working seven hours straight. He barely nodded when Swan entered, but the paper bags explained themselves. Oh, that's good. Is there coffee? Two containers. I don't know what you eat, so I got a variety. It doesn't make any difference. I'm not ready to eat yet anyway, he added pointedly. If the coffee doesn't help, try a couple of these, said Swan, dropping a handful of amphetamine capsules onto a clear space on the console. I don't believe in drugs, said Winslow bluntly. Not drugs, Winslow, they're just something to keep you awake. They're from my doctor. 
Well, that might be a good idea. Maybe later. I see you want to work, I won't disturb you further. In five hellish days, using the tapes and manuscript as a basis for work, three of Foster's sections were in somewhat butchered production. Several high-priced musical whores and show doctors came in and out on demand to bridge gaps, decipher chords, and make sure that Foster made some kind of musical and dramatic sense in the hands of Beef and Weevil, as the Juicy Fruits were now renamed. Faddish influential nervous men in offices on 57th Street and thereabouts began to make oblique, ambiguous remarks about Swan's latest, implying fear and respect for the insanity emanating from the paradise. The enormity of this enterprise unnerved them. Musicians who gained entrance, somehow, came back freaked badly. Groupies had never been so well fucked as at the paradise. Arnold Philbin was said to be facing a murder charge in Amboy, New Jersey. And being in the music business, each of these men privately swore to himself that he would learn any and everything from Swan that could be gleaned, that he would work with or for the man in any possible way if the opportunity should arise. Down in Soho the paradise smoked like a Vesuvian vagina, it was New York's place to have heard about for the month of September. In the family of people connected with the show, strong feelings developed in the hotbed of prolonged personal contact, fatigue and show business paranoia. Swan rode the crest of this madness like a pale plump little Indian prince directing his pet elephant Philbin, who had really not murdered anyone, sweated through the karmic stress coming from that charge but Swan's pulse, blood pressure and psychic effect remained unchanged. He was just a little more aware, a little more human, pleased to be turning everyone's head around. He noticed it when he talked with other companies about subsidiary rights, publication and things like that. Everyone was being such a nice pussy this time around. And Foster itself, roughly handled as it was, emerged as a serious experience, a watershed of 70s filth and madness, a kind of Frankenstein Antaeus creation whose earthy character was molded by a comic book figure called The Heap, whom Winslow had studied from comic books in his mother's attic. It included the very essence of himself as he would have to become to survive, i.e., beef. An evil little man very much like Swan spoke for the chorus of judges. Biker types carried the action. It was all very formal, meticulously following Wagnerian traditions, but rising out of them with a taut youthful directness. Music is people all wired up new, said Swan to the Rolling Stone lady, who had heard he made rather obvious use of women in his life. Those last things with the juicy fruits were the first songs Winslow Leach ever wrote, and when I did them that way he refused to work with me. Now I know why. Hell, dear, you know why. Everyone with ears in town knows why, the boy was a genius, an Emily Dickinson who came to the apple and went mad, but not before he said what he had to say. That's true, said the girl, who was, after all, speaking to the one invulnerable person in show business. What about Leech, who was he, what was he like? I don't know. I don't think anyone else knew either. I remember Duke Ellington, Charlie Parker. I met them when I was very young. I remember Bruno Walter too, my uncle knew him. Winslow was not like them. They still cared about life. Winslow was past that point at 18. You have to realize that he had a very remarkable musical mind. He could score things as fast as they were played, like Mozart, and write them down from memory. In his manuscript there will be three or four alternate melodies for a passage, each one more beautiful than the last. That was where he was, all the time. All the time. Just having to eat was a real annoyance. Girls threw themselves at him. I think he literally fucked himself to death, but his heart wasn't in it. He would just go back to the music as soon as he could drag himself out of bed, or wherever it was. Are you interested in this? Yeah, said the girl, who had succumbed. Well, you can't print this, but Winslow had a cock that reminded me of that line in Dylan Thomas about the old goat that suffers up dying or whatever the line is. It was exactly like his soul, very old. He had the childlike quality of old age, if you know what I mean. The innocence. Anyway there's a girl in the show he was in love with. With her he was like a bashful hick. I'm quite sure he was too shy to approach her. There were several pages of this in the next issue of Rolling Stone, and an enormous picture of Beef, now said to have been imported from Poland. Beef, Swan explained, was a child of his times, 
whereas Winslow was a child of God, and they formed a classic Apollonian Dionysian division, with Winslow the Apollonian despite his alleged death from sexual indulgence. Sometime very close to the time of this interview, Winslow finished the work. He would have liked to go back over it checking for errors and resolving many small decisions he had deferred, being under the impression it would be performed as written. But he was suddenly very sleepy. After stopping for a Coca-Cola, he decided to let himself doze an hour or so, finish off the details, and press the blue button to let Swan know Foster was ready. He slid off, thinking about the sacred little blue button, which he had determined not to press till finished, and fell into the strange sleep of amphetamine poisoning. It was a long sleep, about fifteen hours, and he woke slowly, very disoriented. Part of him was quite awake, he remembered exactly what had to be done. His body was inert, though, and he was unaccountably depressed. He was bothered about the delay too, until he realized that Swan had been by for the manuscript, which was missing. Spotting the same Coca-Cola he had started the day before, he took a swallow, along with a couple of the pills Swan had given him. Then for some reason he began to look for his opening night clothes, which Swan had brought a few days previous for him to check for size. These two seemed to be missing. Finally he remembered the blue button, which he pressed. He then stepped into the shower, but when that was done there was nothing to wear but the black costume he had been wearing all along. He pressed the blue button again, long and hard, thinking now about opening night, and about those elegant clothes, which he felt he had earned. As the pills worked into his system he thought more and more about opening night, and he realized in passing that he didn't actually know what day it was. He picked up the phone to the box office, but the line was dead. There was a sharp ping in his head as his smarts came back, and he viewed the situation as he had learned to do at Ossining. Seeing it that way, it was obvious Swan had him locked up here for some typically devious and selfish reason. Unfortunately, Winslow couldn't think of a thing to do, though the wildness was building in him. Finally he began to examine the lock and door, not knowing about the biker guarding his only exit. On stage the rehearsals were continuing. Swan, Beef and two highly paid arrangers had gutted Winslow's final version of Foster as they saw fit, and pretty much had it together, although Beef was showing signs of extreme nervousness and was very irritable as a result of Philbin's pills. In addition to the pills, he had some cocaine brought in, and some small lozenge-shaped purple pills to take the edge off. He did not see any way he would be allowed to sleep in the twenty hours before opening and didn't see how he could make it. One of Winslow's songs was running round his brain endlessly despite his best efforts to concentrate. Salutations from the other side. I can see that you're the devil's pride. Do you realize that all of you donated something horrible you hated that is part of you? I'm your nightmares coming, true. When he sang this song, he felt like a mad beast. It roused a frenzy that he deplored as a cold-blooded showman. But Swan had them doing it over and over. In his box, pale and composed. Swan knew this was a showstopper, precisely because of what it did to his magnificent lisping new star. After one final take on this song, the theater went silent, and everyone understood what Swan did, that it really was all together, that they were about to turn the music business on at last, after many phony empty years. Eyes all about glowed with something beyond Philbin's pills, and at that moment those with good ears heard a faint, far away but unnerving scream. Some heard it and some did not, but the air congealed as those who did stared at each other. Swan, wearing headphones to make communications to the stage easier, did not. Good, he said. Very good. I think parts one through four are perfectly all right, all we have left is five. In fact, I think we should all take five before taking on part five. Boss, said Philbin quietly into a mic. I think something's going on with our friend upstairs, or maybe a girl got raped in the hall. The rape is more likely. Maurice is up there keeping an eye on our late friend. Maybe some girl was looking for the WC. You can send someone up if you want to, but we have to get back to work. If we're lucky we may finish in an hour or two, and we might even get some rest. Right, boss. Searching the faces around him as he left, Philbin saw an odd mix of unease and optimism, as the cast reacted to Beef's dynamic performance. That spelled H-I-T. But the half-heard scream evoked the passing weirdness that had been in the air before Swan flushed Winslow. The explosion in the trunk of the prop car had never quite been explained away. 
Phoenix had, of course, heard the scream, being of good ear and unblocked honesty. Standing with the singer Swan had hired to work with her she pondered, looking at faces as Philbin had. Unlike most of the cast and stagehands, she had avoided the amphetamine pills, and she was basically a level-headed girl. Georgina, did you hear it? She asked her favorite of the other singers, a cynical but cheerful black girl. Honey, you know I heard it. I didn't miss that bomb, neither, but whatever it is, it ain't gonna bother with me, cause I am just one little doo-wop in this operation, and this little doo-wop is staying real close to the crowd. You better do the same, honey. Phoenix nodded, glad for a sane exchange. She and Georgina sat on a prop sofa smoking, and the break stretched from 5 to 15 minutes. The pill-takers moved around restlessly, some obsessed by the peculiar vibrations, others having already forgotten that some people thought they'd heard a scream. In Swan's box Philbin's voice was twisted tight with anxiety. They're both gone, boss. No Winslow, no Maurice. The doors open to the studio. Oh. That means, more trouble, I suppose. It might be that Winslow has done away with him too, and stuffed him into a closet or something. He's got a temper, as you know. I think we'll get some rent-a-cops to begin with. If Winslow really is loose that will slow him down. This is a big place, Mr. Swan. I know it's a big place, Philbin, it's my place. I know this is a big opening too, and I know you have a big mouth. I notice these things. So don't put me in a bad mood. Did you hear a scream, Philbin? No, but it's noisy where I hang out down there. I'm sorry I was short with you, Arnold. Can we get on with a complete run-through? I still have some cuts in mind. Winslow was a Yankee, he had the gift of doing things with his hands, but it had taken many hours to defeat Swan's lock and alarm system. After discovering and bridging the alarm circuit, he had studied the lock for a long time, the better part of an hour. He found it was welded to the steel door itself and could not be removed. Whoever had installed it had been paid well to protect the equipment inside. Rummaging around among the tools, Winslow realized that Swan might well leave him there to die. It was a possibility. Just for openers, the room was so tightly sealed that without air conditioning he might suffocate. Suppressing the frenzy induced by hatred, fear and the little pills, Winslow found a way. Under the Formica top of the console was an array of power supplies which would yield as much amperage as needed, and the current supply to the studio was generous to provide for stability in the equipment. There were also several enormous capacitors for the same purpose. Starting with this equipment, Winslow worked half a day and created a primitive but effective arc welder, with which he eventually was able to melt the bolt. It took 11 hours in all, and when it was done he was drenched with sweat and every bit as crazed as he had ever been at Ossining. He had kept the tape of his opera going all this while to cover the noise, and the experiences he had subsumed in this music hung obsessively in his mind. He thought most of all about his ravaged face, and that Phoenix would probably feel sick just from looking at him. The makeup he had used to mask it had long since washed off, and he avoided the bathroom with its mirror. The lock defeated, Winslow rested in silence. Then he went to the refrigerator and ate an old corned beef sandwich, drinking the last Coca-Cola with it. After this, he opened the door very slowly and quietly and saw the biker guard at the end of the corridor facing out the other way, asleep. The man would have to be killed, so Winslow made himself a weapon, a kind of pike, made from a four-foot steel rod which he filed carefully for another hour or so. The man died suddenly, waking as the metal went through for the one deathly scream, quickly terminated. Then Winslow hoisted the dead man on his shoulder and made his way to an unused bathroom, where he stripped him and put on the leather uniform. Leaving his own costume behind, he continued with the body to the catwalk where he could observe the stage from above. There he simply hung the naked man over a beam in a dark corner and looked for Phoenix to appear below. He saw that the stage had been extended with platforms into the audience forming a huge cross, which he liked. He saw people milling around backstage, and heard the music for Act 5, coming from the pit, though not exactly the way he had scored it. He crouched, patiently waiting for Phoenix's entrance and instead saw Beef, Beef in heavy glitter with black lipstick and coiffed yellow Shirley Temple hair. Winslow's Puritan soul recoiled in shock as Beef strode on, chopping guitar chords as he advanced, but the artist in him said to wait, 
and he listened in cold anger to what the hired arrangers had done with his music. Beef opened with other side, then, and Winslow realized what had happened. When Phoenix finally came on with the other girls, his problem resolved itself, he had to get her back the part, somehow. He wondered what day it was, and how long to opening night. Finally he settled for temporary disruption, by dropping the metal pike to an empty area of the stage, where it stuck into a plank and remained upright. Sonatabitch, said one of the fruits, doing duty in painted face as a backup singer. The rehearsal stopped dead. What the hell was that? screamed Beef's falsetto into the silence. Just get started again. I'll take care of this, bellowed Philbin hoarsely off stage. Take care of what, Tubbo? I knew I shouldn't be screwing around with a dead man's songs. This place is possessed. He walked off stage muttering, and Philbin stood in his way. Say, will you cut out that possessed crap? You're gonna freak everybody right out of a job. Did you see that spear that came down next to Phil? Well, it's still stuck in the floor, take a look for yourself. Somebody laid it down up there and the vibrations shook it loose, that's all. Yes, you're really sensitive to vibrations aren't you, string bean? Fuck you, fruitcake. Not a chance, said Beef, frightened, but confident of his status. Philbin got control of himself then. If you're so goddamn uptight why don't you go to your dressing room and cool off? After this Philbin went back to his intercom and told Swan what was happening. Unfortunate, but no catastrophe. I've called the Duffy Agency and we'll have another 12 men here very shortly, good ones. The ones we used at the forum last September, basically. You can figure out how to use them. I suppose we might as well do the Apple dance now. I'm having doubts about Phoenix to open that act. Wherever our friend is, he'll be quiet with her on stage. We can go back to Act 5, when the new men arrive. Right. You mean you want to go right into it? Yes. Winslow observed the activity below and recognized what was coming with pleasure. He had been understood, and hoped that Swan would continue to understand, meaning that Beef would be got rid of in favor of Phoenix. Somehow. And as Phoenix did the apple dance, there was peace in his soul. The music had been left as written for this piece, and Phoenix had put together a dance in which she wore an old fedora and flirted with everyone on stage. But when it was over Winslow knew he had been in one place too long. Wearing the leather uniform and mask of a biker guard, there was only his unkempt yellow hair to give him away, and only Swan or Philbin would recognize that. Knowing neither one was near, he walked boldly through the cast to the makeup room, where he quickly found a bottle of dye and some hair oil. With these he went next door to a bathroom and quickly did himself over, tying the hair behind pirate style. Then he searched out Beef's dressing room. After wandering around a few minutes he heard Philbin's voice, Will you cut the shit and get yourself together? I'm gonna be back in 20 minutes, and we're gonna start on Act 5. Before Winslow could react, Philbin stormed around the comer, his steps obscured by the music on stage. But he just took a quick look at Winslow and barked an order at him. Hey you, make sure Tinkerbell doesn't go anywhere. She's a little nervous. Winslow nodded and walked past to Beef's door, where he stood in a kind of at ease military posture, sousing out his next move. The music stopped for a moment and he heard two of the fruits discussing the spear that had dropped to the stage, relating it to the explosion of a week ago. This fucking place is haunted, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a crazy guy loose in the place. Same thing as far as I'm concerned. All right, that's different. Yeah, it's different, but it's the same. Did you take a look at that thing that came down? Well, there's more cornin' down soon, and if we're in the way we go down with it. Fuck Philbin, I'm getting out. Beef knows what's happening, he's no fool. Phil, you know Swan ain't letting anyone out of this place so close to opening. You gotta be kidding. I'm not fucking kidding. The voices trailed off as these two walked away, and the music started again. In the dressing room Beef took several tranquilizers, finding it hard to swallow in his paranoid condition. He drank a can of beer in several gulps to help the tranquilizers. Then realized he would soon be comatose and decided to balance the tranquilizers with a mixture of cocaine and methadrine which lay in a baggie next to his makeup jars. But he realized as it flew off the spoon on the way to his nose that he literally had the shakes, 
and after a few large sloppy snorts he went into the shower, where he sang Other Side, even more wildly than he had on stage a while before. He was aware of being caught between two maniacs and was very frightened. Winslow's ear caught the sound of Beef's voice reflected against the tile shower walls, and he opened the door a crack. Now he heard the shower, and he slipped inside thinking to kill Beef. But his eye was caught by a plumber's helper as he went in, and his ear had been caught by Beef's undeniable talent. It was, after all, Swan who needed killing, not his employees. Winslow took the plunger and quietly went to the shower. Through a split in the curtain he saw Beef facing the spray in the far corner. Beef, he said calmly. So calmly that Beef turned without jumping, only to have his head pushed into a corner by the business end of Winslow's implement. He knew enough not to resist. Fatigue, stardom and multiple drug abuse had rattled him to the point where he didn't quite believe what was happening, but he stood quietly, his head pinned and warm water streaming over his body. Never sing my music again. Not here, not anywhere. Do you understand? My music is for Phoenix. Only she can sing it. Anyone else who tries, dies. The apparition was gone suddenly from beef sight, but he remained in the shower, talking urgently to himself and turning slowly around and around in the stream of water. He had forgotten Philbin, Swan and everything else, and was totally concerned with keeping his physical and mental balance. He was standing flatfoot now, afraid to leave the shower for any number of reasons, when he heard Philbin's voice, an anxious aggressive bellow. What the hell you doin'? Mr. Swan says twenty minutes he means twenty minutes, hot pants. Beef strode naked from the shower with dignity, and his eyes darted in all directions, ignoring Philbin. He put on a robe and sat at his dressing table, but did not begin to apply makeup, nor did he ring for the makeup girl. Listen, man, I just went clean out of my mind right there in that shower, or else there's a real phantom for this opera. I need something special, no more of this aspirin and baking soda bullshit you pass out. Something came in here and told me not to go on with the show, and he wasn't kidding. It was one of the guards too, fatso. Maybe you should let me have some of what they get, whatever that is. You're out of your fucking mind, but you're a fucking performer, beefo. What you want I ain't got right now, but I'll have some after the rehearsal. You'll have it for the opening, don't worry. Arnold sweetie, there ain't gonna be a show, because I'm not doing Foster. Something came in here tonight and told me this music was only for Phoenix. Anyone else who tries, dies. A sweat burst all over Philbin's body and he understood that it had really happened. My neck still hurts from where it pushed me up against the wall, added Beef. Philbin sprang up and delivered the ultimatum, look, fancy pants, you're doing this show. People who fuck around with Mr. Swan get real hurt. You better think about it. We got another 20 on the way any minute. That's the bottom line, honeypot. The bottom line is writ by someone brighter than you, fatty. My bottom line is, I know the part inside and out, and I need a break more than I need rehearsing. You might find out what's happening with your leather boys while you're about it, too. This thing was in uniform. A right, Tinkerbell, I mean it's a right if it's a right with the boss. Thank you, said Beef, you're really quite nice. Now would you get the hell out? And get me some fresh guards before, you blow the whole ball of wax? Just stay right here. If you need to lie down, you might as well get some rest. I'm gonna arrange for your personal safety direct with Mr. Swan. There's no windows to this room, right? I don't know. Philbin looked for himself, had Beef lock the door after he left, and found a stray biker to guard the door. Then he trotted rapidly up two flights of stairs to the box, where Swan sat alone and unaffected. It's him, boss, it's that Winslow. He got into Beef's room and blew him out total. Well, who else would it be, the cleaning woman? He's gonna kill. Swan, he's gonna do it. He told Beef that the music is for Phoenix, and like he's gonna blow Beef away if he goes on. In about five minutes there will be another dozen and a half guards, Arnold. Why don't you think about how they can be used to best advantage, and while you're at it see that our own men understand the situation. If the two groups don't get along that will be another headache. Boss, said Philbin, quieting down, the way this building is set up it would take a hundred men to keep everything covered. The basement is like the catacombs, just to begin with, and the upstairs is full of old passages. 
you know what it's like. We gotta flush him before we go any further even if it means postponement, sorry, Arnold, no postponements. That's just too silly, you've got to be kidding. Are you kidding, Arnold? I wasn't kidding, no, but you're making the decisions. I told Beef he was too wound up on drugs and that he should take a breather. Not bad. He knows his part cold, so it's no problem. I suppose if he spends a few hours with that ego of his he'll be himself again. At this point I'm sure he doesn't know what to do with himself anywhere but stage center. Swan conveyed that he wanted to be alone again to think about Act V, and when Philbin went into the corridor he was met by a detachment of thick-necked Duffy rent cops two of whom he assigned to guard Beef, and the rest of whom were stationed at critical points about the theater. The bikers were set loose to search the theater any way they liked. LaGuardia Place, or West Broadway as it was better known, had begun to show strain as the scene in and around the paradise moved close to opening night. It was a newly genteel neighborhood, and the residents, many of good breeding and independent means, didn't much like the constant flow of limos, bikers, funky freaks and punk kids from Brooklyn, Jersey and Queens. It was too bad about them. Swan had bought up the police and the neighborhood pals, and the ad hoc citizens committee got smilingly stonewalled by these powers. The roaming crowd continued to build, and the carnival world surrounding the paradise engulfed all of Soho. It had been a long hot summer, and clearly October 1st would be the climax. There were robberies, street fights and graffiti for blocks around, and groups of freaks from all over more or less camped along Spring Street. Even derelicts from the Bowery were drawn to the excitement. The bikers, who alone of the employees were allowed free entrance and exit, were distributing white powders at low prices more or less at random among the street people, and the result was instant mythology. The summer of love was being reborn. It was a simple and satisfying myth. It gathered the leftover acid burnouts cheek by jowl with quizzical teenies who could hardly remember the first moon shot clearly. One downtown newspaper excoriated the gathering scene as the absolute pits of showbiz hustle rape, but the other, which had been quietly purchased by a swan subsidiary, extolled the marvelous warm new coming together. It did not, to be sure, carry such local stories as that of a boutique owner, a plump, pleasant, well-bred, well-off young man of 29 being sodomized in his shop by several bikers after an ill-advised remark. Although this incident and others like it occurred in broad daylight, they were generally ignored by Swan's paper, but it did carry an off-the-cuff interview with Swan under the head Bring Back the Music to Music. Alan D. Swan, who has changed more horses successfully in midstream than anyone else in music, spoke to us at length yesterday about being tired of music swallowed by production, hype, spectacle, personality, technology, sex and everything else. Swan, who looks just about the same as he did in 1961 when he came from nowhere, Texas, according to some, he doesn't discuss it, to write, sing and produce Jusson, baby, says he has staked more or less everything he has on the late Winslow Leach's Foster, which Swan calls the first truly genuine work of its kind, the first one that dominates possibilities rather than being sucked under by them. It takes genius to do a thing like Foster, just because it's so big. Winslow was big too, an Abraham Lincoln kind of person. He was also one of the most incredible musical minds I have ever encountered. He makes the rest of them just look silly, the way Otis Redding did, the way Ray Charles did, or Stravinsky. He wrote all kinds of music into Foster, it's a history of the best that's happening since King Oliver and Louis Armstrong came out of Storyville, and that history goes right on past us into the world of science fiction. The amazing thing is that people leave Foster feeling unconfused, because Leach understands the experience so totally. He makes the nightmare of our century beautiful and endurable. Naturally, we are producing this work only in the narrowest sense of the word. I haven't allowed any of the usual, well, tampering is the word I suppose. What we do when we fill in weak spots for immature artists. So the joy of this project has been pretty overwhelming. For all of us, but particularly for me. Frankly, I don't give a damn about gold records anymore. The Juicy Fruits went gold a couple of times a year working part-time and hardly ever touring. But this is exciting. God knows, the 70s have needed something. I lucked out, really. Winslow Leach came to my audition rather than George Martin's or Paul Rothschild's or Dick Perry's, or whoever. He was a full-blown mature artist who knew what he had to do, and were doing it. 
When I look out the window and see that wonderful ferment in the streets, those looks of belief on young faces, I feel very good. It makes me realize that religion can come in on us from anywhere. Nature, a loved one, a Botticelli, a song, they can all give us that intimation of immortality. The fact is, Foster is far more than an intimation, it is a complete and total explication of the truths that our cultural anxieties have obscured for better than half a century. Indians will understand it, Jews will understand it, Australians will understand it. I believe even the French will find something praiseworthy in it. It had now become rather difficult to gain access to the theater, because mobs of crazed young people got in the way, looking for stars. Some did see stars when bonked in the head by irritated bikers and rent cops and the stew was bubbling fiercely by the afternoon of September 30th. After Winslow's threat to beef, Swan had Philbin gather the entire cast and crew in the large basement room for a meal and pep talk to clear the air before opening. When heads had been counted and Philbin was sure everyone was there, he stood up and spoke in a loud hard voice that indicated he didn't want to be hassled. We all know some funny things been happening around here. There was the car, there was the thing fell off onto the stage, and Beef says a guard came in and threatened him yesterday. All right. He paused, almost having mentioned the missing biker, which no one else was aware of. The other bikers thought Maurice was back in Ohio to see his sick kid. I want not to talk to everybody at once on behalf of Mr. Swan, who is talking, a little rest, to let you know that we now got 55 people, male and female, in this place to make sure there is no more of this bullshit, cause it's an interference with your artistic endeavors, and Mr. Swan says your endeavors are too good for anybody to be fucking around with them. We all know what we got here, right? We got a hit. Everybody's got credits for doing something on a Bafo production. If no one goes wandering beyond certain points in the theater, there's no way anybody gets hurt. No way. The table brightened visibly. We also got another separate crew sear chin out the rest of this place, independent of the people keeping watch on the stage area. Do you all have an exorcist? asked a southern voice at the far end. Philbin managed a laugh, mainly because it was a funny line and he was needing a laugh, not because he liked the content. His laugh served to offset any paranoia that might have crept back into the air. He had to keep talking because Swan had instructed him to hold everyone in that one place for three quarters of an hour without their being forcibly detained. He detained them with boredom, then a question and answer period. It was difficult, because weeks of drug-driven work had made them restless. They knew they should be getting on with things. In the theater Swan was standing in the middle of the stage, trying to flush Winslow as he had done once before. When Swan established conversation with a person, he could generally have his way, but Winslow, whose words came alive only for song, was not interested. He watched the little man from above, thinking of murder, and the little man was thinking likewise. In his hand, he kept his hands in his side jacket pockets as he peered around and above him, Swan had an accurate and expensive .28 caliber pistol which he intended to use. He had decided that Winslow, being too smart for everyone else, required personal attention. We must talk, Winslow. You totally misunderstand, Phoenix was simply unable to handle the part, she was too short, she lacked dramatic presence. That's something I happen to understand, it ended my own personal career. He waited. He knew his voice was as smooth and friendly as ever, but Winslow was young and learning fast. As to the changes in the music, they were absolutely necessary for this production. Damn it, Winslow, nobody is performed as written, including Bach and Mozart. You should know that. We had a simply incredible schedule, there was no possibility of you finishing the work and supervising, surely you see that. This is theater as well as music. He stopped with shock, realizing that he, Swan, was explaining himself to a crazed teenager, that his voice was not quite right, that the pauses were not perfectly effective. Come down here, he screamed. You overgrown lummox, it's time you grew up, the whole mess is purely because of your infantile infatuation. Winslow did not hear the last of this. He had enjoyed hearing Swan's composure crack, and he was busy hoisting the cadaver of the dead biker off its perch. After an effort it went over, landing behind Swan, who thought it was another sandbag until he turned around. Then he became cool again. All right, Winslow, he drawled, I'm available to talk to you any time you come to your senses. 
We are, in case you don't know it, the greatest team in show business. You, me, and Beef, who cuts that silly bitch down to the ground when it comes to your music. Then he took a tarpaulin the painters had left in the wings and rolled the body into it. He continued rolling till it had dropped out of sight into the pit, and went for a couple of bikers to dispose of it, which they did without question. This taken care of, he found he was sweating heavily, something he liked to do only on his own schedule. He was quite worried that the bikers would misconstrue Morris's death as being his or Philbin's responsibility, and this was very bad. He was finally beginning to react to the strain of many sleepless days, and of course the unending problem of Winslow. He walked back to his box keenly aware of body cells screaming for surcease, deliverance, peace and sleep. In the corridor he met Philbin, who looked to be bearing up pretty well until informed of the new body and the related problems. Christ, I gotta talk to them quick. This is gonna take a good story. Do it, and come right back. I'll probably be napping in the box. But he didn't go to the box, his body rallied as he looked down into the magnificent midnight blue of his theater, at the luxurious impeccable sets. He rested. His brain achieved alpha state quite unexpectedly, and he admitted to himself that in Winslow he had come to grips with someone truly remarkable. And that this in itself was an inherently good thing, dissipating his boredom and stimulating his productivity. Foster was, after all, a magnificent achievement which could never have come about without his resources being brought to bear. The thing that rankled was Winslow's ingratitude. But then, Winslow was mad. He did not know the rules of the music business, or any rules at all besides those of music and electricity. Having resolved his vile mood, Swan was ready for whatever Philbin had to say. It turned out to be good news, in a sense. The bikers, informed that Winslow was the culprit and on the loose, had sworn vengeance. They were combing the building from asshole to appetite, as Philbin expressed it. But as it happened, this was no immediate help, because Winslow, groggy from lack of sleep, had gone out a window and down a fire escape. From there he had got to the top of the marquee, a very elaborate two-tiered thing created by Swan and several engineers, which afforded a protected spot in the shade for Winslow to nap. He counted on his sharp ear to let him know when the music started again, but he slept through the final rehearsal, and it was dark when he woke. It was the sirens that woke him. Several police sirens coming from different directions as other precincts sent help to the locals, who were unable to cope with the huge crowds. Winslow peered cautiously over the marquee and was startled by the congestion. It was worse than the Port Authority terminal. After a moment he realized it was opening night. Winslow's capacity for wishful thinking allowed him to believe there was some question about whether Beef or Phoenix would be singing, and he re-entered his waking state with an open mind. He would do what he had to do. He had slept half a day, during which the speeding bikers had ransacked the theater very thoroughly, starting from the top down, leaving a man to patrol each floor. As Winslow was about to re-enter the theater, he heard voices on the fire escape above the crowd and the sirens. Beef's aggressive lisp and Philbin's jersey heavy tones. Where the hell do you think you're going, Tinkerbell? I thought we had an understanding. This place is cursed by the undead, screamed Beef, but even his very loud voice was largely covered by the mob and sirens. Winslow moved across the marquee, very interested. He was, at this moment, not wanting to kill anyone, especially a fellow artist, although he was, as his father would have said, committed by his threat in the shower. Bullshit, continued Philbin, there ain't been no trouble since that spear business and your hallucination yesterday. How come he didn't do nothing since then? You been singing. Can't you feel the vibes in your own house? Screamed Beef, whom Winslow now saw to be carrying his guitar and an airline bag. Bad, sport, real bad. I couldn't even read my horoscope today, the bad karma is so thick around here you need a fucking aqualung to breathe. I know what this all is, speed. Speed? What do you know about it man? I take the stuff. You just pass it out. I know real real from drug real. Listen, I'm a professional, said Beef, with careful elocution and a sharp hissing in the middle of the word. But he was defeated. Though large enough to hurl Philbin out of his way, he saw the immense crowd and was mesmerized. There was no way through a crowd like that, besides which it was his crowd. As they turned to go back up the fire escape, 
he caught the briefest of glimpses of Winslow's masked retreating head. It's him, it's him, he screamed in a voice that amazed Philbin and cut through the surrounding noise like a knife. Oh fuck, I'm losing it completely, he said then in a calm voice, thinking he had hallucinated. Get me to the church on time, he muttered at Philbin, who led him back in a kindly way, being familiar with opening night freakouts. The luck Swan claimed for himself in the newspaper interview was with Winslow at the moment. His re-entry to the building was unimpeded by the roving biker crew, which had worked its way to the floor below his escape window. The one guard they had left behind was powerful but dull, and well wasted on drugs. Told to pace the main corridors, he did so endlessly and obviously, like a black leather robot. He was convinced that the murderer of his friend was somewhere down below, since the search had been very thorough. Besides, there was also a rent-a-cop on the top floor to help out. He was a fearful little old man, eager to avoid both the pacing biker and the phantom. Another manpower drain was created by the incredible mob gathering in the twilight. And finally, Swan, realizing that Winslow might indeed make an effort on his life, was protected by a number of bikers in his vicinity in some ill-disguised, hovering rent-a-cops. Swan had got away for the night, had steamed and showered, had been tranquilized and massaged, but he had not rested as well as Winslow. Winslow's job was simple and to the point. He would stop the show. Swan, on the other hand, had many things on his mind, an infinity of small catastrophes to be circumvented, deals to be concluded at the peak of the madness so as to get the most advantageous terms. People whose presence was necessary, and whose words were important. It was a task remembering all this, and in spite of his unmarred face. Swan was past forty and did not have the easy perfect memory of Winslow, whose simplicity allowed him perfect concentration. Nor did Winslow have opening night jitters as he padded down the old corridors of the paradise. As he left for the theater, Swan decided he did. It was just a little funny to him, and he forgot about Winslow. In the Swanage, bothered as he was by the complex of details only he understood, he had recovered his ego. There was essentially nothing to the situation if all were admitted. He was on top, and would stay on top if he didn't do anything silly. He was armed, and just as dangerous as Winslow if it came to that, and he had not been taking little pills that suddenly drop a person into the abyss of disjointed incompetence at the wrong time. That would tell too. He pictured himself as a kind of ageless Archie Moore of the rock business, but a heavyweight. Jack Johnson, maybe. Jack Johnson had been hit from time to time, but he had gone on and on and on. Winslow thought about himself not at all. He went down the corridor till his senses told him the biker was coming back. He stepped into an alcove, and as the man went by Colcocked him with a vigorous shot on underscore the man's thick skull. Then got him out the window to the top of the marquee, where he expertly bound and gagged him with his own nylon rope and leather mask. After this he lashed him to a steel girder with more of the excellent nylon rope. He then became the man's replacement, and after pacing both directions realized that only the very nervous little old man was up there, crouched in a corner away from the action, and ready to leave altogether in case of excitement. Winslow's problem was that he needed to get to the area above the stage, or some place where he could get at Swan. He systematically searched the deserted area and finally found a trap door which would get him to the level below. The trap door pleased him a great deal, and he decided that putting Beef out of action was acceptable. Beef had been warned. He, Winslow, had taken a chance warning him. Now Beef was defying him, really. And Swan could be later. Much as he hated Swan's stealing his opera, he didn't care if he lived or died. He might even be prevailed on to help Phoenix, with Beef out of the way. So Winslow worked on getting the trap door open till he had broken out in a heavy sweat. It hadn't been used for many years, and the damp had swollen the wood. But finally, with some work with the biker's knife and the steel bar which he used as a lever, Winslow got the door open. He then received a shock, because the door opened onto a busy hallway leading to a projection room, a light show platform, and the audio mix room, all of which were hung in a kind of gondola in the middle of the ceiling. The projection room would be deserted though. He could see from its little window that the room was unlighted. Taking the chance, Winslow dropped through and darted for this projection room. Inside he found bikers. Some of them were continuing the search, but some of them had a clever girl down from the Berkshires, who had managed to get into the building. 
Her face was bruised, but she was a sturdy type, and was finding the bikers no worse than some Ivy League types, if she cooperated. In fact she had sensed that cooperation would save her life, and was into it. She had even got her vaginal lubricant out of her bag, when her situation became clear. The searching bikers were pretty much distracted and ignored Winslow, since he was in uniform too, and the room was dark except for several flashlights. The grunting and panting took him by surprise, and he stood there. A profound blast from the band, topped by close harmony from the fruits, made conversation impossible. You want some? asked one of the sexually involved bikers. Nah, said Winslow, who could mimic a voice very easily. You're making a mistake, shouted the other, shining a flashlight on the milkmaid face of Penelope Johnston of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and Gramercy, Park, New York. The music had reminded Winslow what he was supposed to be doing, and he walked out, then got to the catwalk leading across the blacked-out ceiling to the area above the stage. He crawled his way across, trying to avoid the light show effects and the spots, and not until a black light strobe sequence was he seen by a very spaced-out elderly hippie whose eyes had rolled far upward. There's a guy up there, said this person to his companion, but he was ignored, because the fruits had now taken hold of the audience. Winslow saw it from above and admired it. The stage had been extended into the audience by a four-foot-wide platform running to the back of the theater, and this was crossed at the golden mean point by another, forming a giant white cross on which the three fruits danced, sang, and played with minds available below. The cross was covered with a crystalline reflective substance that caught the light like snow and focused attention perfectly, and the fruits were painted to resemble something between clowns and ghouls. They sang as they danced, we need a man that is simple perfection. There's nothing that's harder to find. Someone to lead us, protect us, and feed us, and help us make up our minds. They sang it well and knowingly, finding the echo of Mick Jagger's prime that Winslow had captured there, they were three devils dancing on the brink of a giant waterfall. Winslow stopped a moment in spite of himself to admire the effect. He saw Swan's box far away, too far to bother with. Then he crawled forward, the strobe and black light came on again for a moment, and a fruit looked up in the midst of seizing a hat from the audience to see Winslow's figure, or think he saw it. But, like beef, he was at the point of doubting what he saw, and he was very busy. He kneeled on the runway and reached for a breast, recoiling when a benumbed collegian escorting the lady of the breast reacted. A scream went up, and friends pulled the collegian back. The fruits moved on, spraying cans of incense at people, talking to them and provoking them, as they'd been doing since street corner days across the Hudson. A dummy was hoisted from a near seat where it had been planted, and was attacked by the three, torn, to pieces, which were thrown to the audience. About that time, Winslow crossed over to the area behind the set and rested. He was wishing he had more of the nylon rope, because from where he was, he could have dropped a noose around Beef's neck when he appeared. But for the moment he was out of ideas, sitting and watching the show like everyone else. He realized he would need a weapon. Then the fruits finished, the band went into the ballad Phoenix had liked so well and Winslow waited a moment to see if she still had the number. After the audience had cooled down she appeared stage left to a heavy orchestral drone, wearing a flower child dress. Then she took them all out to a sweet place light years from the previous song. Winslow crouched, watching and listening, remembering how he had played it for her, wondering if she remembered. It put him in a bad mood, reminding him of the ugly scars under his mask, and it sent a wave of creative thought through him. He was near a prop window. In the prop window was a prop neon lightning bolt, sloppily installed with a great deal of wire hanging down to an unseen power source. He thought of smashing it down on beef in the middle of his first number, but it might be taken as part of the whole mad production, which would probably continue. And there would be dozens of bikers and rent-a-cops around as soon as he made his move. After Phoenix's number, a device to focus the excitement generated by the opener, the theater went dark. After a half minute or so, a single spot focused on a coffin rising slowly on invisible wires, with the entire cast prostrate in the atmosphere of a black mass. It was nothing Winslow had had in mind, and he was stupefied for a moment that Swan had done something so pandering, so outrageous and vile. Shortly Beef emerged from the coffin, slowly, with the movements of a Frankenstein. To clarify the effect, he was made up with many blood-colored lines on his body, which gave the impression he had been taken apart and sewn back together. 
There was a perfect silence as he emerged, a rich fulfillment of many private dreams belonging to various members of the audience. It was in a sense a real coming together, members of high and low estate united for once in religiosexual understanding, though passively. Winslow was impressed, but he had a job to do, and when he heard the new and very debased version of his song, Life at Last, he began to cast about for a better weapon. He moved slowly along his girder, seeing nothing until he happened to look up and notice what looked like a huge window box. He stood up precariously to examine it and found it to be full of water. It was a rainmaker. He felt good all over, as if a fine melody had come to fit some difficult words, though he realized that his plan would have to depend on Beef's getting himself more or less directly below the rainmaker. It was between scenes now, though, and Beef had temporarily disappeared, so Winslow made himself comfortable in the darkness. Then he recognized the opening for, the hell of it, and crouched tighter, as he freed one end of the enormous trough of water from its mount. He found he was grunting under its weight, just able to balance it. There was a roar from the crowd as Beef appeared, and another roar from his deep chest, roll on thunder, shine on lightning, days are long and nights are frightening. A hellish roar from the audience rose to meet him, and engineers in the gondola made adjustments for feedback, echo and EQ, Beef's voice emerged again, triumphantly wild, like a giant Amazon trumpeting victory. He stepped to stage center, up onto a little platform in front of the fruits, who were putting their all into it, feeling the solid power of hit money pouring into their accounts. As Beef mounted this platform they declaimed, good for nothing, bad in bed, nobody likes you, you're better off dead. At the window above, Winslow finally had a fix on Beef, and released the loose end of the rainmaker, drenching Beef, short-circuiting his guitar and giving him a hard electrical jolt that took his breath away, froze him for a moment. In that moment, Winslow pulled the neon lightning bolt from its mount and hurled it down, praying its cord would be long enough. It was, and it finished Beef in a brilliant steaming flash. It also finished the wiring circuits temporarily, and the theater was plunged into darkness and relative silence. Winslow scrambled to the catwalk leading back to the gondola, his work done, and his getaway covered by darkness and confusion. He heard screams below as he felt his way to freedom. More and more screams, a panic was building. He felt it under him like a forest fire. In his box. Swan had not been surprised, or even very shocked. He had been one of the few to notice movement at the set window, but by the time he got Philbin on the intercom, the deed was done. He stepped out of the box and headed through the dark as fast as possible toward the near wing. It was logical that Winslow would be waiting for the next development, and to Swan it was also logical that the show would go on. His reputation and every cent he had were invested in it. He arrived backstage almost simultaneously with Winslow's arrival at the projection booth and the recovery of the electrical systems. Philbin had directed the stagehands to close the curtain manually, and had read Swan's mind further. He was talking urgently to Phoenix when Swan arrived. You gotta get out there and sing. You know this next number. We got about 50 seconds. You're crazy. Some maniac killed Beef so you can sing in his place. He's still out there. Don't disappoint him or there'll be more bodies. She nodded. The song was, Through the Back Door, a jazzy Chicago-style blues Winslow had written with Jimmy Noon and Bessie Smith in mind, and it was about sodomy, heterosexual sodomy. Reworded for Beef, it had been perfect fag rock material, but it was originally a product of Winslow's unforgettable afternoon with Phoenix, raunchy love song by a Puritan who had seen light. Of course I can do it, it was written for me, remember, said Phoenix, who was sure enough to look Philbin in the eye and almost laugh at his anxiety. She had forgotten about Beef that quickly under this new demand. Yes, of course you can, said Swan, walking up to them. And you will, in about half a minute or all hell will break loose out there. Is E-flat all right? Phoenix nodded, exchanged a look with Swan, ignored Philbin and started for the stage with a subtle gesture of her body that expressed many things, one of them not being a clear memory of Winslow Leach. So much of him had gone into the music that, as a singer, she simply responded to the songs. And Winslow had been one of many afternoons. Stopping just off stage, she pulled the pins from her chignon, letting her hair fall full length down to her buttocks, and then ripped the front of her blouse down to the waist, letting her breasts be seen. Finally, she slapped herself hard on each cheek, 
bringing a flush to fill out the makeup. Okay, she said. The curtain rolled back with a slow heavy swishing sound and the music started as if nothing had happened. The terror that had been in the marrow of her bones found its way out through her voice, and she sang the song as if engaged in the act it referred to. The theater remained dark except for the spot on Phoenix as she moved down the glistening white path through the audience. As she walked and sang she saw faces touched briefly by the spotlight, looking up at her with a dazed pleased emptiness. It turned her on, opened her throat, loosened her soul. They accepted everything, and so did she. The applause at the end was frenzied and incredibly long, almost drowning out the fruits as they went into the next number. Swan was back in his box now, watching with cold, intelligent and perverse lust, feeling he had won again, somehow. Winslow in the deserted projection booth was so taken in he was no longer concerned about his escape. He was helpless with love until the wave of applause broke the spell. Then he darted up the stairs, out the window to the marquee, to collect himself. In her dressing room Phoenix sat in lonely confused ecstasy, looking in the mirror, tired beyond rest. The dark under her eyes focused their excitement, and she saw that she could be beautiful, really beautiful. On the table was a bunch of large deep scarlet hothouse roses, which she first ignored, then examined. The card read, To my new star, Swan. And soon Swan was in the room with her, quiet and friendly, comprehending the whole thing. He put his hand gently under her chin and turned her face up to him. Phoenix, he said thoughtfully. Oh, Swan. How's beef? It's a pity about beef. How is he? Dead. But let's not talk about that. Let's talk about you, Phoenix. I like your name. We won't have to change it. You're going to be a very big star, Phoenix. We'll be recording live tomorrow night, and we'll be going on tour. He paused. Well, there are no words to express what you are going to become, he finished slowly. Whatever you want. I owe you everything. Just give me that crowd again, she said with earthy sincerity. Tomorrow night they'll be yours, all I want is your voice. And another pause. Is that all? She said this in the rough warm lower register of her voice, and Swan smiled slowly. No. We'll go to Swanage and celebrate. I'll wait for you in the car at gate 4. Don't be too long, the crush is getting worse out there. Phoenix was longer than she realized. Still confused, she took a quarter of an hour to get herself together. Before she was quite ready, the door opened and Winslow stepped in, wearing the same leathers. Are you the one to take me to the car? He nodded, taking her wrist firmly, and she went along, still in a narcissistic daze. Other bikers cleared a way for them in the corridor to the elevator, but once inside the elevator she saw him press the button marked tower. Why are we going up? Swan's outside. Winslow didn't trust himself to speak and remained motionless. Who are you? she asked, suddenly afraid and her voice unsteady. And Winslow did not know what to say, aware of himself as an ugly freak and murderer. The door opened and he pulled her along the roof toward the fire escape, and he pointed far below where Beef's body was being placed in an ambulance. Please don't, I'm afraid. Don't be afraid of me, Phoenix. You know me? Who are you, really? I'm Winslow. Do you remember? She passed from shock to hysteria in a moment, staring at his masked face blankly. But Winslow's dead. Her voice had a tinny unreal sound. No, not quite, he said woodenly. What do you mean? Who are you? Why don't you take off the mask? Winslow laughed the slow dry heavy laugh of his country childhood, but it was loaded with pain as he realized she didn't understand, and really didn't want to know. Swan's taken my face and my music, and now he wants you, but you're all I have left. No one will sing in the paradise again, no one will ever sing my foster again, no one but you. His voice slid up, gaining intensity, and Phoenix turned to run, but Winslow caught her arm. Phoenix, let's leave this place. Swan will destroy you too. You killed Beef, didn't you? My songs were only for you. I know your voice, you know my music, I can't go with you, you're crazy. Don't you see them all down there waiting for me? How can I give that up? Do you hear what they're chanting? They want me. 
They want more than you ever can give. They're fools. Well, I'll give them whatever they want. They glared at each other stubbornly, he ignoring the crowd's roar and she hearing nothing else. No, Phoenix, he said gently. But she sensed his moment of indecision and broke away to race down the fire escape. He followed her, but without knowing what to do. When they reached the marquee he went back into the theater, and mixed with the exiting crowd, still in a fog. In his limousine, parked in the alley leading to gate 4, Swan was elated and silent, smiling with interest at the riot swirling around them, but Philbin was nervous. Where the hell is she? he asked urgently. Philbin, have you ever seen such a crowd? No, and I never want to see another one. There was a pause. Look at them. They've really been entertained. They never want the show to stop. The paradise is more magnificent than I ever dreamed. How often is a rock star fried on stage? Quite an attraction, said Swan, and Philbin chanced a careful look at his employer. So we're a hit. Who the fuck cares? With that freak on the loose, the paradise is finished. The paradise is just beginning. Tomorrow night Phoenix will finish the opera. Are you kidding? The cops are bound to close us down after this. But Arnold, I can't disappoint my public. You know how it is with the police. It's just money. Outside, two bikers spotted Phoenix and rushed to get her into the car, and then beat a retreat to the exit door. The limousine edged forward into the mob soberly, shoving unlucky persons along in front of it, and a path cleared. And a huge cheer began. Phoenix started to cry after a moment in the car. Swan, Winslow is alive. He killed Beef. Swan put an arm around to soothe her. Where is he? On the roof. Hearing this Philbin picked up the phone from its console and dialed the police, reporting this information. Then he opened his window a few inches as the car edged by a policeman. Hey. Officer. Listen, the guy who killed our star is up on the roof. Do you hear me? After a moment he jumped out of the car, slammed the door and shouted into the cop's ear, then they both headed for the fire escape. I remember when I first met him. It wasn't the same person. He was so sweet. Tonight he told me he killed Beef to help me. To help me. Don't think about it. Tonight is your night. That poor boy meant no harm, but it's no help dwelling on it. I won't have your triumph ruined. In patient exasperation he found a vial in his pocket and put a spoon of coke up to her nose, then another. Oh wow, she said softly. You really have it all down. On the roof Philbin and several police officers found no phantom, but Philbin made contact with Chief Huffnagel, and a minute search of the building was made. Still no phantom was found, for the good reason that Winslow had left. Stopping briefly to pick up his old clothes in the costume room, he had joined the stragglers from the theater and had gone to the Allen to wash and rest. But a new surge of anger and bitterness had seized him after his shower while he sat in his old room thinking about Phoenix. He had killed the wrong man. In his reflections he came to like Beef very well. Beef, he saw, had been like himself, a radical that didn't fit the show business equation. He had murdered Beef, but the responsibility was Swan's. As with all the rest. Swan had in some way forced him into that murder. He wasn't much concerned with killing the biker, having been through near murder at biker hands himself. He could not sleep, much as he wanted to. The job wasn't done, and there was no leaving the whole rotten thing behind till it was. Finally he went to the donut shop, where he sat under the fluorescent lights drinking coffee and eating donuts while the resentment built up. He knew his judgment was worthless at this point, but he trusted his compulsion because it so closely resembled his musical inspiration. The compulsion was to kill Swan, even though Phoenix had already moved into a different world where Winslow Leach was an embarrassment. And Winslow was suffering from sexual deprivation, something no woman in Dunphy, Maine, had been able to create in him. He sat stewing, his scar to the wall, looking sometimes at his newly skinny arm, and the coffee ignited the amphetamine in his bloodstream. Nothing to live for, he said quietly to himself, seeing the resemblance between himself and other desperate hopeless people at the counter. Nothing to live for, why not die, it's worthless if you don't give life a try. He stopped suddenly in this thought, realizing that he was writing no new song, 
but another set of lyrics to, the hell of it. It was grimly amusing to him, and he then felt as if Swan had somehow got into his head and would be blocking his every impulse as long as he bothered to live. Which was to all intents and purposes the same as being dead. Seeing it clearly made him calm, because he could again understand what he had to do. Knowing little about women and money, Winslow was unable to understand Phoenix in her new incarnation, but he had grasped the overwhelming fact of power, and suspected that with Swan out of the way through his own personal action, Phoenix might change. A great deal might change, and if it didn't, the world was better off without something like Swan on the loose. So Winslow paid for his three jelly donuts and two cups of coffee, and was on his way back to the Allen and its treacherous memories. These memories allowed him no rest, and finally he pulled himself together for a visit to Swanage. With him he carried the leather suit and mask, a short length of pipe and a grim operatic fatalism, for he now regarded himself as a soon-to-be dead man, knowing how well the place was guarded, and knowing that Swan would be expecting him. Wearing collegiate jeans, dark sneakers, and a dark blue shirt, he hailed a taxi in front of the hotel, and had himself dropped off a few blocks away from his destination. A few careful observations from adjacent corners showed a strolling cadre of bikers, out of uniform but obvious. The building, gothic and with big walls all around, was a problem itself. While he watched, a fine misty rain began to distill out of the sultry night. Finally Winslow just walked up to the man in the doorway to the garden, where he had entered before, and asked him for a cigarette in his most unaffected main tones. Having been told specifically by Mr. Swan himself that he was in disguise and to behave naturally, the biker behooved himself to find a cigarette for the boy, who vaguely reminded him of his own origins. Being out of uniform, he had to think about which pocket had the matches, and while he was doing this, Winslow got him with the pipe. It wasn't a clean blow, but the biker didn't think to shout, and the second blow finished him. Winslow ran across the street with the man on his shoulder, and dropped him over a parapet into Riverside Park. Then he crossed the street in a furtive run and went over the wall. It seemed sure that he would be trapped inside one way or another when the man was missed, but he didn't care. He was too occupied with trying to figure out where Swan might be in this enormous complex of buildings, turrets, gardens, and pools. In the waterbed room, Swan was having his own problems, which were more subtle but still very annoying. He was only too aware that he was not getting off on Phoenix, except in a shallow gamesome way. It was a long time since Swan had bedded with one person, much less under pretensions of genuine romance. The cocaine had stimulated Phoenix, but more in the direction of her dreams of musical glory. She understood their partnership as it existed, though she could not have expressed it. In fact, would have denied it. But she wasn't uncomfortable. Swan was, just a little. Swan would have preferred his usual Lotus 8 tablet with scotch and milk, followed by 15 or 20 minutes of private thought, but he knew better than to enforce usual rules at unusual times. She saw this and appreciated him, but without the hot impulse Winslow's innocent genius had inspired. Swan had even taken some cocaine himself for the occasion, breaking a strict rule, but it numbed him more than anything. Her tongue on his neck was one tongue after hundreds, likewise between his legs. He was thinking contracts as much as anything, but he returned stroke for stroke, that being the easiest solution. They proceeded at a snail's pace, but not disturbed by this, because each had what he and she really wanted out of the situation. It was the beginning of a romance that the media would shortly imbue with everything it lacked, and the beginning also of a triple forte world tour that would leave a trail of legends and gold records to mark the turning point of the 70s. They both wanted that. The rain got heavier, they sniffed more cocaine. Phoenix drifted into a mindless schizoid pleasure and Swan resigned himself to a bad following morning. He developed an erection, finally, and began to see some things about Phoenix besides the voice and the star potential. Winslow watched from above, seeing a gold room with a huge round waterbed at its center, and the girl he loved on it with a little man he hated so much that it was beyond emotion. He slammed the skylight with the pipe in a maniacal fury and was amazed when it did not yield. It was bulletproof thermopane several inches thick and had cost several thousand dollars to install. It was also some twenty-odd feet above the waterbed, and his blows were silenced by the rain, now pouring heavily. Although he was crying with rage and frustration, a song was building in Winslow's mind. 
It came to him quietly as he stopped trying to smash the skylight, never thought I'd get to meet the devil, never thought I'd meet him face to face. Heard he always worked alone, that he seldom wrote or used the phone, so I walked right up to meet him at his place. As he was seized by this malevolent song, he too was being watched, Swan, whose involvement with Phoenix was still less than total, had been seized by an urge to check his security, and on the pretext of passing water, had gone through the bathroom to the white room with its closed-circuit TV console, which monitored all entrances. On it he saw the very wet Winslow leech, crouched and crying to himself as the song composed itself in his head. The heavy rain and thunder obscured the audio portion, hence Swan did not hear Winslow humming his song, but he was captured by a powerful intuition that it was Winslow who was his real star, voice or no. He pondered it, knowing that Winslow could not leave the window, and feeling very akin to him. Winslow, he said softly in his perfect purr, Winslow, we've misunderstood each other a great deal, but we do have something in common. Then he laughed, feeling better about this than he had about his smash opening or anything else the last few weeks, knowing that he had Winslow on a leash, that aside from the possibility of another murder, there was really no problem. You can't help yourself, and neither can I, said Swan to the kneeling image. But then with a start, he thought about Winslow's absolute passion for Phoenix. It was only too absolute, from Swan's point of view. He had seen it before in young musicians, and he had seen them go off with the girl never to do another damn thing worth recording. He also knew that both of his young protégés were quite out of their minds at this point, that Phoenix might arrive at some place whose values allowed her to love a maimed freak, and that Winslow was the type subject to religious conversion, in which case productivity would cease. He flicked a switch which gave him a view of Phoenix in the gold room, where she appeared to be in a simple-minded coke trance, not yet missing him. Then he turned to another console, set to the walkie-talkie frequency of the guards. Hear me now, Swan speaking. Do you read me? Several yaws greeted him. Listen carefully, very carefully. Don't do anything till I have finished. On the roof, near the gold room skylight, is an intruder. I know who it is, and don't want him injured in any way. I don't want him captured either, he's harmless. I want him driven off, but I don't want him hurt or captured. Let him know you're after him, and he'll leave. Let him leave. Any man who lays a hand on him is on the list. Do you understand? More yaws, and as Swan watched Phoenix, he wondered what to do with her. She had a simple monogamous nature that infuriated his perverse tastes. She would acquire power as she acquired success. He found he was sexually aroused at last and went back to the gold room. Phoenix smiled a hot smile, and he turned her over face down to begin a series of little bites on her white little ass. She began a series of little animal gasps, and the evening was redeemed. Winslow saw none of this, being still crouched with his head on his knees in total despair, the song already finished, along with his life, as he saw it. His despair was concerned more with the difficulty of killing Swan than the loss of Phoenix, and he regretted his decision not to act out his original murder-suicide arrangement with the dynamite. That was no longer possible with Swan on his guard. Amphetamine withdrawal intensified his depression, and he continued in his atavistic crouch, waiting dumbly for inspiration, wishing he were dead. But his musician's ears picked up the shouts of the bikers as they scaled the walls, and without thinking further, he retreated to his rope hanging down to the garden, then scaled the garden wall to safety, followed only by the shouts. Phoenix had it on good authority from her grandmother that people who expect to be perfectly happy in this world go crazy and end up in hell, but she was just about as happy as she had ever expected to be the next morning. She was a sound deep sleeper, and waking up was a long process for her. She slept late and less wakened, and no one woke her, so it was past eleven when the sun bothered her eyes. Opening them, she felt as if in a movie, the ceiling was very far away, likewise the walls, and the brightness was overpowering. She sighed a delicious sigh of dreams fulfilled, a little girl's sigh which still had an unusual sound because of her unusual voice, although no one was there to hear it. It took a while to remember where she was, but that didn't bother her, because wherever it was, it was a great improvement on any other place she'd ever found herself waking up. She regretted that a man wasn't there, but it was a mild regret, because after all, men weren't that hard to find. A fairyland like this was very hard to find. 
As her memory collected itself she went on being very happy, because now all the desperate scrambling that had been going on since age 15 was at an end. She had arrived, it was no dream, she was in the room, she was not only in the show, she wore the show, and Swan had kissed her very own little ass the night before. Not as well as her friend George, or even Winslow, but that was secondary. She sat up very secure in this knowledge, also knowing that Swan couldn't be there with her, because he had so many things to attend to. That was all right too. One of the prerogatives of stardom was a more or less total choice of sexual partners, all in good time, with weeks off in the Canary Islands. She knew all about it, though she'd never actually been there, her imagination had accurate Kodachrome reproductions of those places, gleaned from magazines, television and lucky acquaintances, and she'd practiced the appropriate lines. She bounced out of bed to these sugarplum visions and stood in front of the largest mirror she'd ever had the pleasure of meeting, an ancient gilt-edged thing about five by nine which Swan had had restored. She shook her bright, frizzy hair, matching it against the hair below, and gave both ends a shake, thinking she was very lucky to have hair that happened to match prevailing style without chemical and other modification. She just happened to exist at some cosmic crossroads where she literally was where it was at. Her mouth was the in-mouth, a small flexible instrument with a childlike pout. Her breasts were pretty, nicely developed and above all, not too big, perfect for braless living. Her shanks were slender, and her body had a small virginal tightness that hadn't changed in five years of funky scuffling. She giggled with pleasure, thinking from here on out I can wing it. I've got it and I'm keeping it. Her brain bubbled like champagne and then segued abruptly to the thought of coffee. Then yogurt, which she knew all the longest living people in the world ate in large quantities. She wondered what homemade yogurt would be like, with good fruit. A quick end to pimples, someone had said to her, Georgina the black girl in the chorus, who could be her special friend now. Phoenix was smart enough to know she could go on learning about the subtleties of music and life from Georgina for a long time, and that Georgina was smart enough not to mess with a good thing. A sound emerged from Phoenix's mouth, a sound that would have been a keening adolescent squeal, but which her remarkable velvet voice converted into a marvelous smooth seductive sound that very few people could resist. She wiggled her body at the mirror, liked the effect, and did some more, experimentally. If people were ready for shows in the raw, she was ready too. She gave herself a kiss in the mirror and went back to the bedside table, a very large hand-rubbed black oak piece with carvings around the edges and a little electronic console built into it. Charmingly installed in the console was an antique telephone, which she used to call Georgina. After salutations that lady rose to the situation grandly with a laugh that celebrated Phoenix's luck, her own luck and an era of good feeling she hoped would last forever. Georgina knew that while she could cook a song as hard as Martha Reeves and dance with both feet off the ground indefinitely, she was 31, skinny in front, and black. Will you come shopping with me this afternoon? asked Phoenix, who knew she needed a friend. Honey, there's nothing I like better, unless it's good blow, or both at the same time. When you going? As soon as I have some coffee could you come down? Sure, I've been up for an hour trying to get my hair in shape. The call consummated, Phoenix found herself intrigued with the little console, symbolic of the male world of macho gadgets. If you knew how to press the buttons it was a kind of musical instrument, a way of changing your environment around the way you wanted it. The little panel was like swan, smooth, expensive, modern, but set in antique luxury, and reduced to subordinate dimension. She saw Winslow with buttons too, but big solid ones set in no-nonsense military-style spaceman panels. How to operate the devices arrayed there. There was an audiovisual intercom to Swan's little empire, and a whole subset for services like food, guards, regular and cable TV. There was a Watts line phone for calling all over the globe with a minimum of inconvenience, and a device for checking against electronic bugs of any kind anywhere in the house. Unfortunately the function labels were in French, so that she had to experiment, and during this process Swanage was suddenly full of questions, confusions and demands while the staff learned about the new star's presence. The coffee was biker delivered in 11 minutes, the best coffee Phoenix had ever tasted, Café au la brewed with Swan's personal mixture. With it were her first brioches and a note from Swan, whatever you wish. Swan. A friend of mine is coming in a little while, she announced to the biker. I want everyone to be very nice to her, as if it was me. 
Then after that we're going shopping so we'll need a limo and a driver, and someone to be with us. The black leather robot nodded and said, right, and it all came to pass. Georgina had a small amount of marijuana which had been subtly treated with diverse substances to reduce agitation, and they smoked this while relaxing over the second pot of coffee, which was followed by the yogurt Phoenix had dreamed about earlier. As their sense of mutual interest and respect merged, they felt very elevated, as if a miracle were occurring and they could just barely stand it. Georgina leaned back in a 19th century Italian chair and her backside felt more comfortable than she could ever remember. She laughed. Honey, I just never saw such a fancy house. So the expedition started later than planned, but it moved through the exasperations of midtown Manhattan with powerful ease. The limousine was driven by one biker, who specialized in that, and the girls escorted by the crown prince of the bikers, a small, intelligent and relatively well-balanced type who was their spokesman and negotiator in dealing with the outside world. Without a word being said, the trio caused a flurry of slavish excitement enjoyed by all, but especially by Georgina, who tripled her own wardrobe in the process at Phoenix's insistence, and whose outrageous remarks had been lying in wait for such salespeople for many years. I wouldn't wipe myself with that one, she said to Angelo Bianchi, whose taste for filmy nothings was legendary. He laughed gaily, his assistant stared blankly, and $1,500 went for two filmy nothings and a hat. Swan's morning had begun earlier. He had awakened to the thought that Phoenix was, finally, the one fly in his perfect ointment, and he had adopted a certain attitude from Winslow, that things could be gone about directly with no loss. Putting this together, he had arranged a meeting through the head biker with a specialist, an expensive and reputable specialist who could solve his problem, at least the first stage of it. Swan drove alone to meet him in a quiet middle-class section of Queens, where the man lived alone with a trunk of hardware, as he called it, rifles and pistols of different specialized types. After a very short bargaining session, it was agreed that the specialist would knock off Phoenix on stage during the marriage scene. He would fire from the old abandoned projection booth behind the gondola, using a telescopic sight, and would wear biker gear to facilitate his exit. The specialist would receive $7,500 in front and an equal amount on completion. The man drank beer throughout the short interview, and thought about the possibility of snatching Little Swan, but that wasn't his line, and it would get him a bad reputation. Having disposed of this, Swan drove back to Manhattan in a brisk free mood. He never drove and was rarely by himself, so it was a novelty. He stopped for newspapers and was delighted to see that the opening had broken the front page of each one. Even the time seemed shaken, though it characteristically became too involved in the music, the tragic trail that continued even after the composer's unfortunate early demise, and other background information. Other newspapers grasped the simple spectacle, the importance of crowds in heat, and the unflagging genius of Swan himself. It was becoming a brighter and brighter day, and it was only 1.30. On impulse, Swan called a man he knew at the times, announcing that he and Phoenix would be married on stage that night during the wedding scene, hopefully to purge the tragedy of opening night. Then, feeding dimes into the pay phone, he called other publications, feeling as he had a great many years earlier, before he was Alan D. Swan, owner of recording, production, management and publishing companies, theaters, studios and souls. Arriving at Swanage he found that Phoenix was still out shopping, and he went directly down to the paradise with Philbin, who sensed a new and unnerving detachment about his boss that he could not understand. Philbin had been turned off by the violent opening night crowd, to the point where the paradise and everything connected with it were distasteful. He remembered Joe Colombo's death at the height of similar festivities, and Beef's gloomy premonitions. Boss, we got problems with the cops. There were a lot of repercussions from the scene last night, and Beef getting killed of course. Huffnagel says he ain't gonna risk no retirement benefits or investigations. Huffnagel is on videotape counting his payola, Arnold. But we can go over his head. What is he, precinct captain? Yeah. It's not gonna be so easy to get to some of these people, Swan. All those investigations, you know, it ain't like it used to be. It's always like it used to be, Philbin, including your job. Have you read the papers? We got four stars, left, right and center. Even our enemies capitulated. Think of that, Marvin Gershonson congratulating me in print. Philbin looked at the Hudson in despair. Twenty-something people are in the hospital from that crowd last night, 
I mean, really in the hospital, like a few of them aren't gonna make it maybe. 5,000 were in ecstasy. Fair exchange is no robbery. Okay, I'll see what I can do. After a pause Swan spoke again. Phoenix and I will be married in Act 3 tonight. Did I tell you? No kidding. Congrats and all that. You know, she ain't never done the last two acts. That's kinda hairy, I mean, we can't have a murder every night to get us off the hook. We gonna do a run-through? If she's back on time. She can do it, don't worry. Yeah, but the keys, boss. She's got range, but beef was down low on some of those things. She'll fake it. As the limousine entered the Soho district, they both noticed a uniformed policeman on a corner, and another on the next corner. The street people in evidence were more subdued than usual, and there was a restraint that annoyed Swan. He reached for the phone, got the editor of his newspaper on the line and read off a piece to be printed in the next edition criticizing the armed camp created by local police. Philbin watched with no expression, not liking the way he felt, but also very aware of Swan's uncanny way of coming out on top. Still, Arnold Philbin had risen through a world where violence was common, and he knew it could backfire. He smelled danger. I'm going to wear a suit of armor for the wedding, Arnold, helmet and all. Like what the police wear in riots. A bit of satire. Do you think we can have that by tonight? Sure. And you're going to be the priest. What do you think about that? They'll never recognize me back home, said Philbin, who had to laugh in spite of himself. He decided that it was no use resisting, and that he was, after all, very well off, all things considered. At the Paradise, the streets were still clotted with music lovers, many of them openly ingesting illegal substances. They were still being ignored by the police, who were under orders not to provoke difficulties. But Swan didn't. Like the sense of constriction. Get Huffnagel on the phone and do what you have to do, Arnold. This looks terrible. As they exited the car surrounded by bikers, reporters and photographers who had been waiting round the clock surrounded them. A TV crew trotted up hoping for an interview, but Swan ducked in, leaving Philbin to talk. Mr. Philbin, there's been a lot of talk about a supernatural creature or doppelganger haunting this theater. We have several people on tape who claim to have seen it. This from a severe young woman representing a woman's magazine, who had somehow managed to squeeze to the front. Yeah, said Philbin, I heard that stuff too. In fact, Mr. Swan is also aware of this. You get this stuff all the time when something heavy is going down. People get excited and see things. But Mr. Swan is a believer in the possibility of things like this, he knows his tea leaves. Just to put things to rest and expurgate the situation, there's gonna be a live real wedding in the performance tonight. He got a message from outside that love would kill the fear, basically. Who's getting married? asked the newswoman. Swan and Phoenix. They've been secretly engaged. This word sent the media people scurrying away, and the crowd which had magically gathered began to vibrate oddly as heads turned to pass the word, were shaken in disbelief or nodded in homage. Observing this, Philbin wondered what his boss could possibly come up with next. He longed for a steady reliable situation, as with the juicy fruits. Solvent and predictable. Then he too ducked into the entrance, leaving the afternoon crowd to roam and speculate. One effect that Swan's arrival had was to make it easier for Winslow to enter the theater. He was dressed in the black leathers, and went in with the group protecting Philbin, then he went to the lunch counter area, where he stood eating sandwiches and drinking Coca-Cola, wishing he had a gun. He did have the length of pipe, and a knife, but these required getting in close, and Swan was particularly well protected since he had seen Winslow on the monitor screen the night before. When Winslow had eaten he quietly went to the upper level of the theater to observe the afternoon rehearsal, which was delayed by Phoenix's late arrival. But as Foster was performed at the rehearsal, Winslow was gratified. Despite the changes, Phoenix sang Lady Beth as well as Winslow had ever imagined it could be sung. He was not lulled by his victory over Swan, though, because he had come to understand that Swan yielded only temporarily. He began a quiet search of the theater, and a series of eavesdroppings. On the second level there was one puzzling thing, the door to the old projection booth, which was on a dark and used hallway, had been jimmied. 
yet there was no one inside. Winslow was positive this door had always been locked, but couldn't make anything out of it, so he went on. In a space of four hours he restlessly wandered the entire theater, driven on by the little pills, but it wasn't till just before curtain time that he learned of the marriage to be, because no one else knew of it either. Swan appeared unexpectedly backstage, surrounded by bikers and rent cops with a cool but frightening glint in his eyes, and explained how it would be done, and that his suit of armor would in fact be a protest against police brutality in the neighborhood. At least a few of those listening realized he had slipped a cog, but as always he conveyed clearly that things would be done his way, like Hitler arranging his bunker. It was all understood in a few minutes, and Winslow, at the edge of the crowd, was mesmerized with hatred. Still, there was no way to get through the guards, so he drifted off in a fog of emotional pain, feeling very sorry for himself. Although some people noticed changes in Swan, he seemed the same to Winslow. Phoenix looked different to him, though. Success had changed her fast, she stayed near Swan with a gritty possessive look, ignoring the people she'd been working with for weeks. The pair of them created a circle of followers that would be very hard to penetrate, and Winslow came to a conclusion made by Swan not a day before, that murder on stage during the marriage scene would be most convenient. Also like Swan, he had a secret weapon. He had found a hardware store in the neighborhood that sold all kinds of rope, and inside his leathers he had a coil that would allow him to swing down onto the stage. To protect his hands during this maneuver, he would be wearing the official black biker gloves, and under them a pair of cycling gloves with padded palms. A while later Swan returned to his box accompanied by the guards. He was beginning to see in retrospect that Phoenix dying served many purposes. Aside from simply getting her out of the way, and making a legend of his Disneyland, it offered rapprochement with Winslow, who ought to be finally seeing the necessity of Swan in his life. They would join forces in a well-publicized international manhunt with huge rewards, leading nowhere except to very good press and mutual cooperation. It was a hole-in-one, and Swan was sorry he couldn't share it with Philbin. Shortly, a technician brought in a video monitor connected to survey a number of areas Swan wanted to keep an eye on, and he clicked it to the channel covering the front entrance, where a swarm of humanity was milling intensely as far as the camera could scan. For a moment Swan saw it through Philbin's eyes, but reminded himself that it was, after all, the name of the game. When Phoenix died, every one of them out there would feel involved, and would spread the word about black magic at the paradise. Not to mention eyewitnesses in the theater. He clicked to a different channel, surveying the area above the set, and saw nothing as the camera tracked slowly left to right and back. Nothing. Nothing in back of the set, either, or on the roof. The rifleman in the rear booth had been alerted to an unnamed man who might interfere, and the rifleman carried a pistol. And the door to the old projection room was solidly secured. It seemed to Swan that when they got through the marriage assassination he would be home free with Winslow. He was not familiar with the New England habit of sometimes making up one's mind irrevocably about something or person, and not yielding in the face of clear evidence. But this was the way it was with Phoenix in Winslow's mind, he had long since stopped questioning that he was in love with her forever and ever. Also that Swan needed killing. The object of Swan's thoughts stood thirty feet from the door of Swan's box, looking like a member of the Black Leather Auxiliary, which were given a lot of room by everyone else. It was even easier to be there since Philbin had called in a brother club from Philadelphia to bolster the staff, and most of the two groups were strangers to each other. People passed on their way to the boxes, rich, well-born people, some of whom had never attended a rock concert before, but Winslow was unaware of this aspect of the occasion. He was focused on the six men in the vicinity of the door. Six large armed men, and two more inside with Swan. Finally he walked away, giving up the frontal assault. Instead, Winslow went down to the orchestra level and watched the first two acts. He was annoyed by the Broadway bastardization of his music, but so happy for Phoenix that he thought tears might roll out from under his mask. Before the break after the second act, he went backstage to the wing where he thought Swan would make his entrance. He stood toward a corner, ready to charge, hand on knife. But when Swan came, the protection came with him, and Winslow was sure there were a few disguised rent -a cops in addition. He knows I'm going to kill him, thought Winslow, and felt sorry for Swan briefly. 
Then his thoughts were interrupted by a stagehand opening a large cardboard box, and Swan getting into a uniform Winslow recognized instantly as the type used by prison guards. His skin prickled as this unfamiliar sight stimulated repressed memories. Without thinking, he turned to leave, reappearing later on a catwalk atop the set, where he tied his nylon rope and put on his two pairs of gloves. Swan could be stabbed through the visor. That bit of folklore Winslow had picked up at Ossining. That failing, he planned a second try at a space in the back between two halves of the armor, which would be exposed as Swan fled. If they were more or less alone on the stage, he figured he would have these two chances, because Philbin was a useless bundle of nerves at this point, and Phoenix too weak to interfere. Overhead on the catwalk, Winslow carefully tied his rope to a beam, then waited. Phoenix sang. There was a transition passage written by a person named Sonny Grazzi, who specialized in musical imitations. There was a wedding march from Winslow's original, well, performed, and the three principals arrived at the raised center section of the stage alone. Winslow put Vaseline on his gloves, and listened to his pounding heart during the dramatic silence as Philbin spoke some Latin words. A tremendous cheer went up from the audience as Winslow swung down, but several guards in and out of uniform sprang up from the front row. Swan had foreseen the inevitable. What he had not foreseen was that the entire front section of the audience would be triggered by this advance, and that the edge of the stage would be crawling with fans too numerous to count. They were so numerous and confusing, and so fast in their reaction, the guards were impeded. In fact, several were hauled back down off the stage by freaks who didn't want destiny interfered with, and whose sudden absolute identity with the Phantom made them very brave. They outnumbered the guards, of course, and while several were injured in the scrimmage line at the edge of the stage, the guards themselves, feeling the insensate and unpredictable mood of the crowd, did not respond as sharply as usual, and lost the initiative. To Swan it was all taking a very long time. He bobbed and weaved and tried to shove his way past Winslow, who had somehow lost the knife on the descent. Winslow, you fool, we're brothers. You don't want to do this. Don't you realize I made you an international celebrity in one night? But Winslow had a good grip on the lip of Swan's helmet, and had him under control as he looked coolly around for his knife. It had come loose when he landed on stage, and was kicked aside by Phoenix, who had had enough crazy people for one weekend, and whose reactions were very sharp due to the continuous cocaine intake of her last twenty hours. Cut it out. Cut it out, Winslow. You're going to get in trouble, she screamed. This was clearly heard by many, because Phoenix delivered it in the strong keening upper register as she had learned to do from listening to her Sicilian grandmother. But Winslow was single-minded, and since she didn't actually impede him, he didn't actually notice her. No one impeded him for quite some time. The guards were entangled, half on purpose, and Philbin was dying, because Phoenix had stepped out of the line of fire to kick the knife away, and the bullet had struck Philbin. As he died he wished he had been more perceptive in his dealings with Winslow Leach, and he didn't believe he was dying until he was dead. Before that moment, which came very fast, Winslow had begun to rip the helmet off Swan's head. It didn't want to come off, and to onlookers it looked as if Winslow had become attached to some kind of magnetic tar baby he was trying to shake loose. Phoenix meanwhile had run off stage to get the curtain dropped. Her mind was clear, her show would go on, regardless. Get the damn curtain down and clear them off the stage, she ordered, and the curtain began to drop almost instantly. I'm going on with other side in three minutes, so get it together. Get an ambulance. It seemed to her that the curtain was coming down much too slowly. Winslow. Babbled Swan inside the helmet, you're hurting me. Please, this isn't like you. Please. The little man had begun to cry, which Winslow heard, but he went on shaking him like a rag doll till he saw that Swan had not really regressed to fetal position, but was trying to get something out from under his armor. Winslow helped him, and then shot him with his own gun, firing into the slot in the helmet. Just as Winslow did this, the surge of bikers and crazies rolled over them, and a biker rushed through to get Winslow with a series of thrusts with an enormous knife. A fan, carried away, stabbed Winslow with the bird beak of an abandoned costume helmet. He hardly felt the stabs. He was peering into Swan's helmet to make sure he was gone, which he was. Seeing this, he looked away, 
searching the sea of faces for a glimpse of Phoenix before joining Swan as a partner star in what would be the best-remembered musical production of the 70s.